And what time is it? It is 7.02. So we're only two minutes out of schedule, which is absolutely wonderful. Okay, everybody, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Russell Kahn. I am the chair of the Democratic Environmental <laughs> Caucus. Uh, we're here today to screen the movie Phosphate. Uh, we are blessed to have quite a few uh, great panelists um, in attendance. Um, we are doing this uh, to raise awareness on um, phosphate issues and Mosaic's uh, role in that. Um, unfortunately, we did have a late cancellation. Um, Nikki Fried, unfortunately, will not be with us today, um, but she did send us a recording. It was a last minute cancellation. She had a flight issue um, and couldn't get to a good location. So she did record us a video that I will play um, and we will, with that, um, I wanna thank everybody for being here. I especially wanna thank um, my co-host this evening, Jessica Arman, the uh, president of Sarasota's chapter of the Environmental Caucus. Uh, this would not have happened without her efforts. So she has done awesome, awesome work. Um, we also have our filmmaker, Eric Crown with us, which is absolutely wonderful. He'll be uh, leading some of the panel portion. And we have, uh, Mr. Walter Smith, uh, Steele Bailey, Andy Mele, as well. And we'll give you the full rundown on all of their uh, bios after the film. We wanna get right into the film so everybody can enjoy that. And then we'll do about 45 minutes of uh, Q&A. So if you have any questions while you're watching the film, please feel free to use the chat feature, use the Q&A feature. Um, some of the uh, panelists may respond to your Q&A questions during the film. Um, or we can answer them live potentially as well. So feel free to use the Q&A feature. Um, and with that, let's see. Let's see. Oh, um, just a quick disclaimer for legal reasons. We don't want to get sued by Mosaic or any other phosphate company. Um, the information contained in phosphate represents the views and opinions of the original creators of the film. We have one with us. Um, and do not necessarily represent the views or opinions of the DECF. The presentation of this film does not constitute an endorsement by the DECF. All right, I'm going to move this over so I can. Um, by the DECF or its affiliates, sharers of the film or film creators. The film has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The DECF does not make any representations or warranties with respect to the accuracy, applicability, fitness, or completeness of the film. The film is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have read or seen in this film. Uh, we hereby disclaim any and all liability to any party for any direct, indirect, implied, punitive, special, incidental, or other consequential damages arising directly or indirectly from any use of this film, which is presented with the express permission of the film creator. Okay, so with all of that, Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna give Jessica a minute to speak uh, about the importance of the film to her and why she's engaged on this issue. And we are gonna put, and go ahead, Jessica. Yes, I wanna thank all this evening for being here. I'm Jessica Arman. I am the president of the Environmental Caucus of Sarasota County Democrats. And we started a phosphate uh, resolution that has been now adapted by the state of Florida, as well as uh, a similar one uh, that will be talked about later this evening uh, by the uh, state organization, which uh, Russ is the head of. I just want to say this is our gift to you, Florida. This is my home state. I've known about phosphate mining my entire life. This film is about citizen scientists. I, I really, really, truly love you all. I don't care what side of the aisle this you may be on. This is a non partisan issues. We will need every voice and every hand on the table to stop phosphate mining from encroaching and going further into um, further south to DeSoto County. This movie shows citizen scientists basically, in my opinion, doing the job of what our government is supposed to do, testing water and protecting us from industry. We have to find a way to coexist with this, you know, industry in Florida. Um, I've been aware of it all my life, and unfortunately, now it's really it got the phosphate giant that, in my opinion, cannot fail. And it's a, a really big issue. I will let the film do the talking. I want everybody to please, you know, um, 
feel free to question uh, whatever you want of any of us. We're here for you. This is our gift for you. And we want everyone to become aware so you can help us uh, hopefully spread awareness and fight the good fight against this giant. It is a David versus Goliath fight, but we already got one win. Maybe we can do it again. So enjoy the film and thank you all for attending. Thank you very much for that, Jessica. I am going to put a link in chat. Uh, uh, sorry, um, I'm putting a link in chat. Um, Jessica's chapter helped organize this and had a pretty significant uh, outlay she did personally to help make this happen. So if you like the film afterwards, please feel free to click that link at any point and, and support uh, her chapter and their efforts in fighting the good fight. So with that, um, all of our panelists will turn our screen off and we will go ahead and play the movie for you. It's about 93 minutes, is that right? Um, so without further ado, uh, please grab your popcorn and enjoy the movie. And we'll uh, see you after the movie's over. I was diagnosed with cancer in 2005. The doctors didn't really know what kind of cancer it was or how to treat it. They explained I was part of a growing population of people with hybrid cancers from environmental factors. My tumors were growing aggressively and the danger is they'd eventually grow over my organs and kill me. I became a full-time patient. My life only happened in between surgeries, radiation, and experimental drugs. When the doctors told me the cancer was incurable, I knew I had to make a change. I decided to give up the comfort of security and instead travel around the world, investigating environmental pollution and crime, and see if I could find other reasons that were leading to these rise in cancer rates. And I got to work on some amazing direct action campaigns that really took me into remote areas. There is pollution everywhere. But aside from the plastics, there were also multinational corporations polluting into local riverways, getting everyone around them sick for profit. And with access to clean water disappearing every day, people were fighting back. And at the same time, I saw that back home, people were being poisoned by the industries around them. Childhood cancer rates were up six times the national average. If we can prevent any kids from going through what I've been through, then it's our duty to investigate, find out what's happening, and stop it. So I decided to travel to one of the most toxic places in America, Florida. I always thought of Florida as beaches and Disney World. In reality, one of Florida's biggest industries and best kept secrets is phosphate mining. But for every one ton of usable phosphate, there's five tons of radioactive rock left behind. Florida is so radioactive that the fountain of youth is closed due to radioactivity. People that work in the mine and live in the mine were getting accelerated cancer. And in 2011, cancer became the leading cause of death in Florida. We noticed a study today by the World Health Organization that said that long-term exposure to radiation, even at low levels, can dramatically increase the risk of dying from cancer. The primary use for phosphate is fertilizer, but its byproducts create cancer. And the biggest player in this $85 billion industry is Mosaic. This Fortune 500 company owns over 300,000 acres, which is roughly the size of Los Angeles. They already have mines in four counties and are trying to get into a fifth. The mines work 24 hours a day and they mine 16 million tons of phosphate rock a year. In order to separate the phosphate rock from radioactive elements like uranium, Mosaic uses over 70 million gallons of groundwater a day, which they take from the rivers, use to process 
the phosphate, and then return back to the rivers filled with cancer-causing toxins that lead to cancer clusters all around the floor. And this cancer-causing environmental pollution is permitted by the state. Mosaic is self-regulated, so they only have to turn in reports for a balanced pH level, which allows them to dump harmful chemicals and toxins into the water without many people noticing. Mosaic believes that the solution to pollution is dilution, so they run their water through these outfalls, dump it back into the local creeks and rivers, which eventually works its way out to the ocean. And although none of the state or local governments were paying any attention, what Mosaic didn't realize is somebody was. In 2015, the EPA fined Mosaic over $2 billion for the mishandling of hazardous waste in Louisiana and Florida. And just last year, Mosaic agreed to pay nearly $2 billion to settle a federal lawsuit, the agreement covering 60 billion pounds of hazardous waste. Now, the company agreeing to clean up operations at six Florida sites and two in Louisiana and claiming Mosaic was improperly storing and disposing of chemicals used to make fertilizers. Meantime, the EPA called the agreement a major victory for clean water. But Mosaic has never addressed these health concerns. Instead, they use PR to try to look like good neighbors. They sponsor huge music festivals, put $9 million into DeSoto's arena, give money to the local police departments, put on charities in the holidays and canned food drives. They even sponsor wildlife events. And as one of the largest landowners in Florida, their political influence is huge. And Mosaic routinely sends representatives out to local elementary schools to help educate the children on the benefits of mining. Mosaic, preparing today's students for tomorrow's jobs. Of all the many elements drawn from nature, there is one you may not know much about. Phosphorus. And while phosphorus isn't a word you hear very often, it's something plants, animals, and people need every day. Look at it this way. What do all these things have in common? Phosphorus. Phosphorus moves energy around the plant and makes photosynthesis possible. And what's the most important role of phosphorus? Feeding the world. But where does phosphate fertilizer come from? The largest phosphate deposits in North America lie in the Bone Valley region of Central Florida. Scientists believe that these large phosphate deposits formed from the skeletons and decomposition from sea creatures living in the seas during the Miocene period more than 20 million years ago. Welcome to Arcadia, Florida. Halfway between Orlando and Tampa, Arcadia sits in Bone Valley. And this sleepy agricultural town has become ground zero for the battle with Mosaic. And although the history of phosphate mining is tied with DeSoto County, there has not been phosphate mining here for over 100 years. Mosaic bought up a bunch of smaller companies and inherited the land that they owned, which was zoned for agriculture. So currently, Mosaic is trying to rezone 14,000 acres from agriculture to phosphate mining. But after watching friends and families get sick in other counties, the residents decided to say no. Mosaic was able to get the rezone. What would DeSoto County lose? They would lose a lot of the peace that we have. We can't allow Mosaic to come into DeSoto County. Now what body of water is this? This is Peace River, baby. This river. This is where everybody knows to go out and go canoeing. It's and, gorgeous. Uh, you know, it's all it's all white sand, like a beach, you know? It's, it, it, it's not like that, you know, you go up to party or Manatee or Colt or anything. I started the uh, Facebook group, uh, hashtag Mosaic, against phosphate mining in DeSoto County. Mosaic. Not many people are familiar with what Mosaic is or what, what they do or, you know, what phosphate mining even is. Very few people that know what Mosaic is actually about. They portray themselves to do something and be something that they're really not about. I have a poll up on Facebook. 96% is against the phosphate mining in DeSoto County. We can't allow 
mosaic to come into DeSoto County. You know, maybe they'll actually learn that our health is more important than money. On the day the Board of County Commissioners voted for the rezone, all the citizens showed up to have their voices heard in protest. Come on down, guys. Phosphate Mining Industrial, PMI, the Zoning District of 14,053.40 plus or minus acres of land. Motion for denial passes. Four. <laughs> DeSoto County, Florida, the first county, I believe, in history to actually say no to Mosaic's rezoning process. An incredible video tonight. A massive sinkhole has opened at the Mosaic's new Wells facility in Mulberry. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Wendy Ryan. And I'm Jamison Jeweler. Tonight there are reports of millions of gallons of contaminated water now flowing into the Florida aquifer. ABC Action News reporter Cameron Polam live at the plant with the very latest. Cameron? Tonight, crews at the New Wales Mosaic plant scrambling to stop the contaminated and radioactive water that's seeping into the Florida aquifer. While we're doing our important work of helping grow the world's food supply, we also have a responsibility to the ecosystem and communities around us. We don't just work here, we live here too. Mosaic has become a leader in water conservation and water management. In addition, we regularly organize volunteer groups to help beautify our waterways. Water is closely monitored to be protective of nearby preservation areas, and the environment downstream. They bought a lot of land, but it's agriculture land. It's not mining land. So they have to get it changed uh, to rezone it. Um, and the people and the county have said no. Meet Molly Bowen. Grandmother of 10, an accidental water activist. Molly jumped into this in 2016 after that famous mosaic sinkhole had contaminated her son's drinking water and well water. Molly spends a lot of time in the field doing water tests and then mapping the outfalls and all the different waterways that mosaic uses to release their toxins. And having grown up in the area, Molly is familiar with all the ways the waters connect. And she keeps track of all of the different outfalls Mosaic have and the waters they blend into. Drawing a direct line from Mosaic outfalls down to the Charlotte Harbor and out to the Gulf. Molly's been able to prove over and over with these tests that there are excessive levels of contaminants in the water. She hopes this will lead to more water testing and conversations about how Mosaic can operate more safely. January 1st, 2019, there was some kind of an explosion at the Four Corners Mine near Arcadia. The explanation given was that it was a giant flock of birds, which we did not buy, so we figured we'd go take a look at the water ourselves and go get our very first water sample. The water looked really weird, like it was frozen or had some sort of top layer on it. Since all of the watershed is connected, we wanted to get water samples from all the different areas to get an idea of what mosaic was putting in the local waters, the local rivers, and to see if we could trace it back to a single source. So this we just pulled out of waterway right near the mine. We're going to do a quick phosphate test. 
It says water. That's their fuel oil, their kerosene. They use they use old mo motor oil, like from Jiffy, where you do um, oil changes. They'll take anything they can get. That's why it's a secret ingredient. The thing about that is everything that you touch out there, molds, nuts, anything that's new in a bag, I mean, it's got oil on it. Me and the guys used to laugh about the stickers that would be in there. They'd say, may cause reproductive harm. <laughs> and there was like a bunch of stickers in there. We had more hard hats as a joke. But, I mean, and I don't know, that doesn't have anything. I might have something to do not being about kids, I don't know. And it is dark. This goes, this is at least four, if not, it's even darker than the darkest color, I think. Yeah. So, I love it. You know, that's way over four. And that's the one that had all the oil in it. Then we drove over to another county about 40 minutes away and we wanted to check out a place called Johnson Creek, which is an outfall right underneath of the Wingate Mine. The oil we had just seen was called affluent and affluent is a proprietary mix of multiple oils that the mining company uses. And one of the signs of that discharge is heavy foam. If you look, there's those little bubbles, and the bubbles don't disappear, they turn into the foam. You can see the foam collecting on the rocks right there. This looks like paradise if you don't look too close. But after you track it a little bit, you can see behind me, which is fine. I mean, it's disgusting. It smells, it smells horrible. This is from their, their oils whatever that stuff is they use. That's the freakiest crap I've ever seen. Ugh. What the hell is it? I mean, look at that. That's newer. This this is the longest. You, you know what I mean? That's been there for weeks. That's been there for days. I don't. <sighs> I got a little bit now. There's a little bit of it in there. Watch your hand. I know. This is an, a flow that's coming down directly from the mines and headed directly into the Mayaka, which is a state preserve and also a giant river. Molly pointed out that it looks a lot like the foam that was in Mosaic Sinkhole, where over 200 million gallons of radioactive water spilled into the local aquifer. And as a result, cancer and other birth defect rates went up. It's just it's polluted. It's polluted. It's, it's, taking a break from testing water to try to call Mosaic again. Hi, you've reached the voicemail of Callie Nesland. I'm sorry I missed you. Please leave a message and I'll get back to you. 
Record your message at the tone. When you are finished, hang up or press pound for more options. Hi, Kelly. Uh, this is Eric Crown. Uh, I was trying to give you a call. I'm working on a documentary about phosphate mining and would love to, the opportunity to be able to speak with you. Okay, we're going to try the phosphate expert for Mosaic, who works at the Phosphate Institute, which is sponsored by Mosaic. Or Industrial Phosphate Research Institute. Hi, hey, uh, I was wondering if I could speak to Dr. Berkey. Oh, hi, Dr. Berkey? Uh, no, this is, this is Gary. Oh, hi, Gary. Um, I'm uh, sorry, maybe I got misdirected. Um, yeah, my... I think you did. We do more than help the world grow the food it needs. We give farmers the science to produce more crops at a lower cost. Our work in Florida nourishes farms across America our promise is to always take our commitment to the environment seriously. Together with local communities and environmental experts, we develop detailed plans to preserve our most environmentally sensitive lands. Step one in mining includes clearing off the land. They often do this with burns or they'll just cut down all the trees. This field has been cleared and opened so the mine can expand into it. Uh, the problem is you start to displace a bunch of animals when you remove their habitats, including the endangered animals, the eastern indigo snake, the gopher tortoise, the stork, and the box turtle. The law states that if they run into anything of archeological importance, like an Indian burial ground, they have to stop digging immediately, contact the proper authorities, and let them take over the area. And according to longtime Mosaic employee, that's just something you don't do. I don't know what an Indian burial ground looks like. I mean, I've seen Pet Cemetery, but that's about it, you know what I mean? He is like the lesser of two evils because A, you can save these teeth and these, these Indians that have been buried there forever, you know? Or you can keep people that are alive now. You know, eating. <laughs> so it's, it's like a, if you stop it, it might shut down the whole process because most of it has to go a piece at a time. Not only do they have to buy the property, they have to get a permit for the property and they have to have like several permits to fully really even spike the ground. So that's a lot of money, and once you get there, you don't want to jeopardize it by, you know, saying there's something there that's going to stop you. I mean, it's just stopping progress. I mean, I don't care what my, what my skeleton. So a lot of people don't speak up because they will lose their job working on the dragline excavator and to be the operator of that is one of the highest paid jobs. This machine is so massive it can move over 75,000 tons of material a day. We've heard the buckets are so big you can drive a truck inside of them, so we decided to try it out. With over 340,000 acres already mined in the Bone Valley region, a lot of the locals that have been experiencing cancer and accelerated cancer rates uh, all have concerns about the amount of radioactive leftover. And right here is a great example. This is a mine that is no longer active, but they just leave it like that, scarred up earth. For every one ton of phosphate that's usable for them, they have five tons of radioactive waste left over. And what's left is basically radioactive uranium-laden gravel, which Mosaic uses to sponsor things like the Fossil Fun Zone at the Arcadia Park. They use it to make roads. And none of the citizens have any idea at how radioactive the ground is. And after seeing so many people get cancers and sicknesses in the area, the citizens of DeSoto decided to get Geiger counters and test for themselves to find out how radioactive the areas really are they were shocked to find out they've often been exposed to Fukushima-level radiation. And 
you can buy iodine pills for radiation. You can actually buy, you know, a radiation rescue kit that's going to have iodine tablets in it. Um, you know, this is Cold War stuff. This is not stuff we should be living with in, in today's world. Radioactivity, as represented by the ball, causes electrons to be ejected from their atoms. It's an offensive move based on ionization. Ionization disrupts the structure of atoms of which all living matter is composed. An atom then seems unimportant and infinitesimal, a tiny cog on a small wheel in a miniature machine which, if multiplied millions of times, forms the going concern that is you. But if enough of the cogs are broken through ionizing radiation, the gears grind, the machines falter and stop, the factory shuts down. And although we're exposed to lots of different types of radiation, we're talking about ionizing radiation, which is on the more dangerous side here of the scale. And it's the ionizing radiation we'll be measuring through the Geiger counters. So the three parts of radiation are alpha, beta, and gamma particles. Now the alpha and beta particles are the heaviest, and they cannot travel too far, and they cannot penetrate through skin. And although these are the most harmless forms of ionizing radiation, continuous exposure or accidental ingestion can lead to cancer. So these alpha and beta particles are counted in this counts per minute, the big number up top. Anything over 100 is considered dangerous. But aside from the alpha and beta particles, there's the gamma particle. And the gamma particle is the most dangerous because it can penetrate through skin. And these harmful gamma rays are recorded in the Geiger counter in microsieverts. The natural background is around 0.22, and we were registering at around 1, which is about the levels in that light orange here for Fukushima. Only instead of Fukushima, our sample is being taken at a playground with reject rock from mosaic. So at the levels we just saw, according to the radiation network, if you were to live here for over three months, your chances of getting cancer would increase to one in a thousand. Mosaic is committed to conducting business in a manner that protects the health and safety of our employees, contractors, customers, and communities. We are relentless in our pursuit of an injury-free workplace. Well, I was a structural iron worker, and burning and welding steel, climbing all over steel, going into the mines and repairing stuff, which they would take down the signs hazardous signs and then call the contractors in and then once we got it fixed and then put them back up. The main problem is the chronic poisoning, I call it. They don't like to hear that word poisoning, but that's what it is. I mean, you know, if you inject somebody with a, a poison, and it kills them right away. It's kind of showing some mercy, you know what I mean? But just say you give him just a little little bit every day for 20 years. You know, I call that cruel. Do you have a lot of friends that you also worked with at the time that also have illness now? Oh yeah, a lot of them have uh, lung problems, cancer problems, and kidney problems. Mosaic employed hard coal that the chemical plant will substantially shorten your, you know, your lifespan. Because you want that job. That's what's putting that food on the table for those little children at home. I have a relative that has been working at a chemical plant um, in Bartow. He's recently, and by recently I mean probably the last three years, has just been riddled with cancer. So how many people that you worked with at Mosaic got cancer or had bad health effects um, after they left? Three, three out of 21 that's are still alive. Now the rest of them died of cancer. Uh, but cancer or liver, fa uh, liver failure 
and stuff like that. Most of our younger guys, and they had to wear the bad dosimeter badges, and when it got full, they got laid off. So they would put the dosimeter badge underneath their hat so it wouldn't get radiation as quick. <laughs> they get filled up, and then instead of helping the guys, they just oh, fired yeah. them. Yeah, he was, yeah, well, when he got hired in, you know it was temporary. Well, too, too many kids' daddies was dying. I went to too many funerals. I watched them drop dead one by one, buried them. And I got pictures of some of them, and, uh, and it's just, it's sad. And I live at lawsuit for years. I ate, drank, woke up, went to sleep at night thinking about that damn lawsuit. And I meant those bastards wasn't going to beat me. <laughs> what, what kind of intimidation or, or difficulties did you, did you have with the company once they figured out that you were vocal about what, what you saw going on? Well, you know, the, they tried to get the, the, the judge to put a, a gag order on me <laughs> and all that. And I think he did a couple of times. I just didn't pay no mind to it. I just kept talking. I didn't have any friends. I thought left. Uh, but people, they told people not to even talk to me if they saw me in the grocery store Jeez. or in church. In church. Said, don't have anything to do with him. Hmm. Don't even speak to him if you value your job. That suited me a little later on, you know, through the years. I guess my social life was with the people that had been poisoned. That that got to be my friends. You know, it would be these people that was poisoned, couldn't work no more. They'd come over and I got where I'd uh, just have a little meeting. I'd call it the uh, meeting. You know, we're going to have a meeting. Y'all want to come over? We're going to do some. Uh, ribs, or we're going to have cook some hamburgers on the grill. And we just get together, all of us, and everybody loved each other because they was all in the same boat. And uh, and it, as they died off, you know, it was sad, you know, because so-and-so, you all hear he was in the hospital, he's got bone cancer, he's got lung cancer. They'd want to do video interviews of these people dying, and I'd go because I could a lot of times uh, tell the attorneys what he's trying to say because they didn't understand the lingo where he worked and what he was exposed to. Mm. It's just a sad thing. Mm. It's, uh, it shouldn't be happening. So far, nobody from Mosaic has called me back. Not much of a surprise. We are now going to try to call um, the main person in DeSoto, Heather Nedley, and see if we can't speak to her today. Heather Nedley is not available. Record your message at the tone. When you are finished, hang up or press pound for more options. Hi, Heather. Uh, my name is Eric Crown. I'm working on a documentary about phosphate mining. And I would love to be able to talk to you guys. Uh, I'm in town till next week, and I was hoping maybe uh, Monday or Tuesday we could sit down and do an interview. And if you think Mosaic is only affecting the water in Florida, I've got really bad news for you. Because guess who makes your fluoride? The toxic leftovers from mining become hydrofluorosilicic acid, which is then sold to municipalities all across America to be placed into the drinking water. What they do is they capture the hydrofluorosilicic acid out of the 54% evaporation stream when they're evaporating uh, phosphoric acid, and they use tiny sprays to trap those fumes, those particles, and 
And that's what becomes hydrofluorosilicic acid, and they store it in tanks, non-agitated, where the silica sinks to the bottom. And you know, people drink the stuff, and uh, you know, there's been test uh, study after study at Harvard. And it causes lowering the IQ in children. And, and of course, you too, if you're drinking the stuff, and me too. And you know, it's in everything. It's in cola, it's in beer, it's in green beans. It's in anything that's got water in it, it's got this stuff in it. If it's packed in a big city or outside of a big city because there's so much fluoridation in the country. Also happening tonight, the fight continues in Manatee County. Mosea Company now wants to expand their mining operations, but many of their neighbors tell ABC Action News reporter Adam Weiner they fear another environmental mess. It's chemicals. I have an organic farm. I can't use chemicals in my organic farm. I Tracy Dang fears Mosaic's plan to expand mining operations right across the street from her means the land here will be too contaminated to grow food. It's not only just my organic farm, it's our natural resources, it's our very precious land and water. Dang was among the dozens who spoke out against Mosaic at the second full day of hearings held by Manatee County Commissioners deciding whether to change the zoning of the property called Wingate East to allow Mosaic to mine phosphate. One drive through West Central rural Florida and it is clear that Mosaic is turning our region into a banana republic. Anything that's coming from there, uh, from Mosaic, could beach into here and come through all these properties right here. A Garrett's an organic farmer, and he just lost his USDA organic status because Mosaic was able to rezone 16,000 acres in their own mine. And that actually borders these wetlands that we're looking at, and the wetlands border Garrett's farm. The US government says that any radiation exposure is dangerous to human health, whereas Florida has made slightly different rules um, so that they can accommodate phosphate mining and agriculture. So Garrett has decided to take them to court. You know, this, I mean, it must be extremely stressful, this process. Oh yeah, mining is stressful. Phosphate mining is what stressful. Is what it does to the community, what it right. does to your household. I mean, uh, my wife and I, we've had a lot of issues, you know. Uh, she, she feels like you shouldn't try to take on a global phosphate giant. But you know, some things are worth standing for. I mean, they infringed on my way of life. And uh, it, to me, this is more of a constitutional issue. Mosaic monitors themselves, they then give them those, those results to the county. And then the county just says, okay, you've met the criteria. So, so the, the polluters are self-regulated in yeah, monitoring yes. their own pollution. You, you can't make this up. <laughs> you can't make this up, all right? Those wells uh, were placed in a conservation area where they violated their own work order. If you look back there, the phosphate mining is way back there. It's on the back side of the, the dump. But all these properties are up for sale. And they're worthless, so, I mean, you can't. I don't see that set for sale sign mm -hmm. anymore than that one. Here's this one. This one's yeah. for sale over here. Yeah, that's oh, the tomatoes over there. This is for sale sign. Hmm. Next one's for sale, too, I believe. So when they're next to the mine like this, what's what do the what's the property values end up being? Yeah, about a third of your property, original property value, is what they're they're estimating. One interesting aspect of Mosaic is they're masters of disguise. So here's just a basic looking open fence. And as we drive through, it looks like there's nothing here. Uh, what they do is they build these little teeny berms to keep the mines kind of out of public eye. So when you're driving by, you'd really have no idea these things were here. But then you just go up a teeny berm and opens up the destruction. When I asked the guys why there was no warning signs uh, about the radioactivity or no, uh, no trespassing signs, they said that all the locals know just how bad and how dangerous the area is, so nobody would dare to ever even drive in voluntarily. Uh, this is the tower that a crew was on, and I'm a former tower technician. 
And uh, they were working on the, the carrier up above there. And I, I, I told them to get out of here, man. This place is radioactive, you know. And they were out here for a week working on a project up there. And um, every day I came and checked on them. And, you know, I just said, you know, this is a dangerous thing out here. But none of them knew. No warning signs. Wow. We're out here on property that doesn't say we can't trespass. There's, there's uh, radioactivity in the area. Nothing. Nothing. This is one of the things that we're advocating for. So they they just try to they just try to sort of keep it a secret the, yeah, the, the radiation so yeah. that that way it's not even a topic they have to yeah. to fight for right 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 they don't like to talk about it and uh, you know we we like to we like to talk about it. And so what, what exactly are we looking at here on the, okay, on the so camera? This is, a, this is phosphate extraction that took place in April. By uh, July, they were out of here. Okay, you can see how much acreage they took out of here. Over here is, um, is where they bring out the slurry, and they, they hit it with the water cannons. And that's the result of, that's byproduct right there that they didn't take out of here. That is the actual product right there that they're mining. Is this so? This is abandoned. Like that I means they just stop production on it. Or? Well, they're done. Yeah. So now they're in another. They're right over here now. They're just they're they're about um, a half mile up. Uh, yeah, in that direction where your camera's facing right now. So I'm back at home base. Um, today we spent a lot of day inside of the, uh, right around the mines. And uh, I started to get really sick. Uh, and you can feel a swelling and a pain in the back, right back here, um, which I believe are the lymph nodes. So that's the first thing. And, and it, ha it sets in within maybe being around that dust and that, um, that pollution within like 10 minutes, 15 minutes. I also have a headache, um, and I started to get a, a slight pain in my side the longer that we were in those mines. So I'm not really feeling well tonight. So the end result of the phosphate process is after they've cleaned out and separated the phosphate from the leftover uranium and other radioactive and cancer-causing toxic materials they release back into the water, they have some material that the EPA says they're not even allowed to get rid of. So what do they do? Instead, they build these giant mountains that are called photogypsum stacks. And this water is some of the most toxic out there. Let's zoom in just a little bit here. This crevice just to the bottom right of your screen wasn't here yesterday so it looks like part of the wall is either collapsing or possibly this thing is expanding a little bit second point recovering that 215 million gallons of contaminated water from the aquifer is a process that will take years i said all this poison is going to be in somebody's well don't tell me it's you know like it fell down there in a glass or a jar <laughs> But that's what they put in the paper. So people say, oh, oh, it stayed out there. I don't have to worry. My water's all right until it's, until it's poisoned you. We've gotten some posts on our Facebook page from residents who claim they live nearby and they're concerned about the quality of their, their water. What can you tell them? Well, I, I can assure everyone that the water quality, you know, even on our property is still very clean. Just imagine Florida like a sponge. You know how a sponge looks with the little holes and all in it? That's rocks up underground. It's sitting on a limestone bed. Mm. And that water's seeping. It's seeping right on down into that, right on through the rocks, right on through the sand. And when it hits that limestone, acid eats that up quickly. So it's eating it up, eating it up, eating it up, and then it gets thin, 
and caves in. I think that's probably my worst thing about the whole process is the gypsum stacks because it just sits there with water in it. And I mean, it's the nastiest water you've ever seen in your life. It's just, it's, I don't even want to know what would happen if you drank it. Gypsum's the worst thing that they make. And to be honest, that spill in New Wales, you know, you know we're talking about where everybody said radiation's getting in the aquifer. That, that was, I, I couldn't help but laugh at that. But the problem is with that, that's way worse than anything think it's about, is, and this is a big one, it's the, they call it, they call it pond water. That's what it's called. Pond water. You were told in your MSHA course and your site specific not to, don't drink it, don't even touch it, you know, don't wash your hands in it. It contains phosphoric acid. A drop, like on your tongue, can, can damn near be fatal if not fatal. And that is what was in that chip stack, you know, dumping down in there. That's what they had to worry about. People were out here worried about radiation. Everybody's age just sitting here scratching their head and laughing, and I'm doing the kind of same thing like I had not even in. I'm in Polk County, Florida, where the famous sinkhole happened, meeting up with Luella Phillips, who started to notice her water changing colors and smell weird after the famous sinkhole happened. So we're meeting up at the Mulberry Phosphate Museum. Do you have a miniature Indiana Jones in your family? If so, journey through the past when you visit the Mulberry Phosphate Museum. This is the big point of Mulberry. <laughs> a lot of things here for kids. A lot of things for kids. They have like, at Christmas time, they have Santa Claus here and these little cocoa things. They'll have arts and crafts here. This is probably one of the radio most radioactive places in Mulberry because you have the you have the mosaic drag line right here, well, the bucket. <laughs> yeah, it's been used. And it's it just didn't always say mosaic on it. It has in the past few years. This right here is where they want the kids to come in and play they say this is these, this is average, like the water level of the sodium sulfate and all that stuff, pH balance. Even though it's higher than anywhere else in the state of Florida, it's average for phosphate mining area. Doesn't mean it's safe, it doesn't mean it's good, it just means because of this area, we have higher readings. And that's how they explain our water tests and stuff like that. You know, you guys have had consistently getting these same numbers, and yet people, you know, Mosaic and, and, and authorities are always saying, well, the Geiger counters must be wrong or they're being used incorrectly. What do you say about that? I mean, I'm saying they're full of it. It doesn't take a genius to run a Geiger counter. It doesn't take a genius to know to know what's going on. It doesn't take a genius to be able to taste the metal. Can you taste the metal on your mouth right now? Oh, yeah. On the tip of your tongue? It's like I've been chewing aluminum foil. Yeah. You'll probably get a headache later. But yet we're living in this every day. And it's higher than a radiation treatment. You know, and our kids come here. Because of our health surveys, we found out people who just live within a certain radius of the gyp stacks and stuff. They're, they're getting sick. Their children are getting sick. Back then, they didn't notice their children were getting sick because nobody knew they had cancer until they were older. A large percentage of the children in this area have autism. There's, uh, there's birth defects. There's, there's miscarriages, um, heart disease. High blood pressure is a big one in this area. Kidney failure is a big one. Lung cancer, huge. I've had lumps in my breast. I've had two biopsies before I was 40. And... I've had cysts that turned into tumors on my ovaries. I had two boyfriends, two. One died before he turned 44 of lung cancer and brain cancer and throat cancer. He suffocated to death. And then I had somebody else I was close to and he would have been 52 when he died. He died of throat cancer. So you don't have to necessarily work at the mines. You have to live around them or drink the water or deal with the soil. 
In the coming midterm election, environmental issues have played an unusually large role in the state of Florida, in part due to the explosion of two blooms of algae that have crippled part of the state's tourism economy and killed hundreds of thousands of fish and wildlife. There are many factors driving these blooms, but scientists believe that the mining of phosphorus is one of them. Mining this mineral is a huge business in Florida. Mosaic. The biggest pollutant in the world, as far as I'm concerned. They generate hazardous waste, radioactive waste, but everything they dump goes into the ground and migrates, has to go somewhere, and it migrates to, for example, Lake Okeechobee, it goes to the Atlantic Ocean, and it goes to the Gulf of Mexico. Now, the red tide, the Carinia brevis, that's the one that's out in the ocean, needs oxygen carbon dioxide and phosphorus. Guess where the phosphorus comes in? It's flowing through these bed these cracks in the ground like this and it upwells. Now these cracks are like a bunch of roads and highways under the ground. You have fractures that are horizontal, vertical, and at angles. That's how it was produced. So the water takes, goes this and says, oh, I think I'll go down here. And it goes over here. But ultimately it got to the ocean. The water means everything to me. I've been on the water since I was a child. I live here in Mount Lachey, Florida, where I've you know, acquired a life dream of owning a small mom and pop motel. I'm a captain, I do water tours. So water quality is my sustainability. So in 2018, our ground zero for red tide devastation, millions of tons of dead fish, sea life, dolphins, manatees washing up on our beaches all summer long, uh, devastating our environment and our economy. Um, as those phosphorus products make their way into the waterway and feed the cyanobacteria and feed the red tide, it leads to an ecological disaster of millions of tons of fish kills this year. Over 200 manatees, over 125 dolphins, over 400 sea turtles and tons of miscellaneous fish that were killed this year. Behind that was economic meltdown. Fort Myers Beach was a ghost town. People are lining up at food banks. The city of Sanibel was losing $16 million a day. People are not coming here. Businesses are closing. People have actually committed suicide because of their business losses related to this. Um, that phosphorus, potentially even from the 2016 toxic spill into a sinkhole in central Florida, where 260 million gallons flushed into an, an aquifer. Those aquifers eventually make their way into our, our coastal waters, creating basically gasoline on a fire to feed the red tide as it approaches our coast. Red tide is naturally occurring, but the massive blooms that we have is, are unnatural and they're being fed by the eutrophication of our waterways through phosphate and nitrogen. This is my paradise on earth right here. It's a special place. So would this area uh, be affected directly through the, the runoff from, um, yeah. from the mining? So, at the tip of the island here to the north is Boca Grande Inlet. That's where the Charlotte Harbor, Mayaca, and Peace River flow into the Gulf of Mexico. So Venice Beach was like ground zero. That was day one. That was the first massive fish kill occurred in Venice Beach, just around the corner from Boca Grande Inlet. So the red tide came out here in Venice Beach, and it has gone as far north as the Panhandle now, but initially in the, in the worst of the summer, it was concentrated here in southwest Florida between Venice and Inglewood to Marco Island. But now it's migrated all the way to the um, up the coast to Sarasota. It's still, in Great. fact, it, it's still very high at Sarasota today. Um, we're in our 17th, no, I'm sorry, October. We're in our 15th, 16th month of a red tide. It's unprecedented, it's never occurred before.
Hello, everyone. My colleagues at the Hillsborough County Board of County Commissioners and I are proud to welcome the Mosaic Company's headquarters to our community. Mosaic is a Fortune 500 company and one of the world's leading producers and marketers of concentrated phosphate and potash crop nutrients. This is our first Fortune 500 recruitment win, and it marks an important milestone in our rise as a global business destination. Hillsborough County has experienced tremendous growth in our financial and professional services, IT, and manufacturing sectors. But our phosphate industry, which dates back to the 1880s, continues to thrive. The export of phosphate products and related phosphate shipments played a key role in Port Tampa Bay's growth over the last hundred years. So thank you, Mosaic. You're one of the main activists out here. You're, you're one of the people that has been a big force in trying to get them to change what they're doing and affect people's health. The first question I have for you, a lot of people say, well, you know, this company's so big, you're not going to be able to stop them, this and that. They tell me that all the time. Uh, and so why why do you uh, why do you fight fight? Because I guess I was raised in the fifties. You know, basically, I graduated high school in sixty one, and we were taught that regard what was right was right, what's wrong is wrong, and to stick up for it. And truthfully, I'm just mad enough at them that I'm just going to fight them to the day I die. I've been thinking about having to put my body down here in the swamp so that if anything happens after we're gone and Mosaic winds up with this property, they can't dig. <laughs> they own that property over to the side here and the property here, but they can't get a drag line on it because it'd be too close to my house. So they, if they really want your property, huh? Because that would open up a bunch more money. They say they people. don't. They say yeah. they don't care about it. But um, they spent, what, first 10 years or 12 years that we lived on the property, uh, one of their buyers hounded us trying to get us to sell. But we loved it. This was our home. And really, we didn't understand what, what was going to happen. You know, we didn't understand about the exposure my grandkids and my children. I have half a thyroid now and uh, my daughter has Hashimoto's. My oldest son has Parkinson's. My husband has leukemia. My granddaughter went to sleep at 13 and woke up the next morning. Her eyelashes were on her face. That's how we found out her thyroid's gone. Norma's won the right that as long as she lives on the property, Mosaic's not allowed to touch it. But the problem is the dust. She's surrounded on all four sides by mines, which give off gypsum dust. And it travels airborne to all the surrounding areas for miles and miles, which gives off radon, which is undetectable when breathed in. It's the second leading cause of lung cancer in the United States, killing over 20,000 people a year. So he had to stay in the house a lot because he, with his lung condition, he couldn't go outside our house. We own 50 acres and 50 leased, and he could not go outside our house because we were held hostage to the dust. I was starting to feel a little disheartened. Nobody from Mosaic had called me back. None of the doctors I reached out to would call me back. Absolutely nobody would give me information on Mosaic or environmental pollution. So I decided to try the Freedom of Information Act. I had heard Mosaic also sells their uranium and found that their subsidiary, CF Industries, does have a defense contract. So under the Freedom of Information Act, I made three requests. One to the Environmental Protection Agency, one to the Department of Defense, and one to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to see where the uranium was going and there it was being tracked and sold. I was told by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that there are no files. I was told by the EPA they would get back to me, and I was actually called by the Department of Defense. Good afternoon, I'm calling from the Department of Defense, Inspector General. I'm trying to reach Mr. Eric Crown. I'm calling regarding a FOIA request you submitted on the website. I have a few additional questions. If you can give me a call back at my number, 
6997576. I appreciate it. Thank you. I called them back and they wanted to know why I was interested in Mosaic and what I wanted to know about Mosaic. They told me to stop that line of questioning and that they were going to delete my request from the database. And I needed to get information on them and nobody would talk, so I decided to go ask them myself. So, I stopped by the office. Uh, it seems to be closed at the moment. Uh, everybody might not be here yet, so we're going to head out. Hi. I was just getting some uh, pictures around the area. I thought I'd stop by and introduce myself. My name's Eric. Hi. I just want to say hi to Heather. Hi. How are you doing? Hi. It's nice, nice to meet to you. you. Just wanted to stop by and say in person, hello. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was just getting shots of like downtown. You know, getting okay. the small town look. So yeah. Okay. What does that have to do with our business? Well, I mean, I mean here we are in Arcadia. Here. Yeah, but well, I'm just saying it's here. small town. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. that's all. Just, not you know, all of our operations are in small towns, but oh, gotcha. Wachula would be a better, I think, reflection of our current operations just because we've been mining so long in Hardy County and that's directly oh, okay. north of here. Oh, okay, yeah. We're looking to permit here. Gotcha. We're years away from having any operations or employees here in DeSoto County. Oh, okay. So you guys just so, kind of setting up camp for future stuff? Or? Yeah, I mean, this yeah. Is, we have an office here. We have an office in Wachula. Like I said, I was hoping maybe you'd be here and, you know, I could just say hi in person. So. Okay. That's nice all. to meet you. <laughs> it was nice to meet you. Thanks. All right. I'll email you a little bit later on. All righty. No worries. Have a good one. Um, yeah, that felt a touch confrontational. She was not happy. She wanted to know what I was doing there. So I was at that building for under two minutes and she showed up immediately to question me what was happening why am i there they don't have mining here why would i be getting shots of arcadia um so you know it was interesting they're definitely paying attention um definitely watching so i decided to take heather's advice and go check out hardy county and although there's a lot of agriculture and farm work in Hardy County, the major business there is mining. Mosaic is one of the biggest employers. It has such deep ties to mining, you can actually see a drag line in their seal. In 1981, the EPA did an environmental impact study to see how phosphate mining would actually affect the surrounding areas. They came to the conclusion that if they were to go ahead and build these facilities, that it would constitute a major federal action significantly affecting the quality of the human environment. But it was built. And according to the Hardy County Health Department, the leading cause of death here is cancer. And inside of the town, in the middle of the town square, is this huge mural and it traces the history of the land. So you start with this beautiful nature and then people start to use it and you see scenes of agriculture, uh, which is still very prevalent in the area. Lots of, of additional agriculture. Uh, there's watermelon, there is orange growth, uh, and orange groves everywhere, which by the way, take from the same aquifer the mosaic leaked into. Um, and then you've got, as, as land becomes a little bit more tame, and then all of a sudden, just this empty, vast nothingness. With every generation, we learn more about our environment. And we get better at protecting it. That's how it works at Mosaic, too. We help farmers grow more food on less land while learning new ways to restore wildlife habitat, recycle water, and generate clean energy. So that every generation does even better than the one before. Mosaic. I received a message from a good friend last night saying that there were people inquiring about me. So we are on slightly more higher uh, high alert right now. Um, we don't know exactly who those people work for, but the person that told me I trust 100%, so um, I, 
just, uh, you know, we're going to have to be cautious. I noticed that I was starting to be followed by white trucks, mostly white pickup trucks, occasionally some GMCs. But no matter where I went, there was always a white truck sort of in the background. And when I put the camera up, they would usually drive away. So I had to be very careful uh, while I was out there. I eventually found out that Mosaic Security Company uses all white trucks. I have been told from numerous journalists about the harassment that Mosaic does and how Mosaic works really hard to keep an eye on anybody speaking out against them. Sam? So this is part of us being followed always by these white trucks. Mm-hmm. The most interesting thing would be is if he stopped to visit us. The timing was really unfortunate because we had decided to go back to the Four Corners mine and take a water sample and some Geiger counter readings to get a better understanding of how toxic these mines are. If we could get a water sample, this would be the first time anybody has ever gotten that information. Okay, so we are at the Four Corners mine. We just went to the entrance and we're gonna do a quick Geiger counter reading and see what we can find out. Just about being here. See, the berm over there is actually uh, man-made. It's where they put all their shit at the end. It's going fast. <laughs> Jeez. No, yeah, look how fast it's climbing. With Mosaic being self-regulated, nobody really knows how much radon and other things they're dumping into the water. And getting a water sample from inside the mine is the only way to truly find out. Normally, these areas are off limits. And today, our opportunity had arrived, so we decided to go in and take a look. So we're in the mine right now. Behind me is uh, some drag lines and what appears to be empty pits. So they're just digging. You, usually people don't get this far. And uh, if you can see around me, there's a massive amount of destruction. It's just heart-wrenching. So much destruction. And none of this can be fixed, none of this can be repaired. None of it is of any, of any good or use to anybody. Um, it stays radioactive for thousands of years. Uh, so what are you gonna grab a sample of? Uh, just the water from here. Oh, okay, oh, perfect. Yeah, right there, we got a little opening there. All right, ready? Okay, Make sure go. to mark it too. Okay, this is a unique experience. We got an opportunity to get a water sample inside the mine. Yeah, 
Yeah. Maybe not. Just be careful. You hold my hand if you need to. Careful. We know there's no animals here, so. battle of sorts took center stage today in DeSoto County. At issue, these 14,000 acres of land. Mosaic wants to mine phosphate here. Commissioner's already shot that down, but as Wake News reporter Brea Hollingsworth explains now today, they negotiated. To mine or not to mine? Very simple. We don't want it any further south. After already getting shot down by DeSoto commissioners last summer, Mosaic is once again talking with county leaders about rezoning property it owns within the county to mine phosphate. Neighbors voice environmental concerns at a mediation today. They're digging up and destroying the watersheds, the plants and the trees and everything that protect the, um, and filter the water. Clark Doan, who lives near the Peace River, also worries a mining site will decrease his property value. Who would want to buy a home that's going to be toxic? The mediation even drawing in neighbors from surrounding areas. Many say it's a topic that's bigger than DeSoto County. Unbeknownst to most residents of Sarasota County, Manatee Counties, and Charlotte Counties, a portion of our drinking water, um, the surface water component, is from the Peace River. A Mosaic representative says the company's environmentally conscious and hopes the mediation will help them reach middle ground. Florida has very strict regulations, and we're very proud of meeting those regulations, and we take very good care of the water. Here we are. Molly and I are back. Home sweet home. And uh, we've been collecting so many samples that we didn't do all the field tests because it takes a little bit of time and, and precision and we were um, jumping into places we necessarily uh, weren't necessarily allowed to be. Now that we had water from the mine itself, we were able to take a look at the different levels that it has. And what we wanted to do was test various bodies of water to see if they had matching levels, which would show that it was all treated water and came from the same spot. So this is some of the test water that fell on my arm when I was transferring it over. He created these hives. So everything south has this much phosphate. So there's a consistency. There's supposed to be no phosphate there. And every single stop, uh, spot we grabbed it. Everything's pretty consistent, which is weird because these are not the same bodies of water, but, but almost all the things. Common. Yeah. Just the mine. That's exactly. my point. <laughs> Every single test that, is basically that, the same. They're like the same. Everything's the same. There's no oxygen in the water. And none of these are bodies that connect. And they're coming out and with the exact same results, same. which is weird. The only thing in common is they all have mosaic outfalls. These tests prove to us that the high total phosphate and the low dissolved oxygen means it's almost impossible for fish to live in these waters. So we decided to send the samples into the lab for further testing. And what we found was astonishing. Now the EPA has set the standard for 300 picocuries per liter. And what we found was dumped in over 4,000. Since the municipalities pull water from the Peace River, we decided to test the elementary school water fountain. And what we found is that it was above the acceptable safe limit of 300. And with the proven link between radon and cancer, it became very obvious that Mosaic's runoff was affecting children's health all over the state. And with so many cancer clusters, I couldn't figure out why the state would not even address this. 
cancer cluster is a higher than expected number of the same type of cancer in a specific area over a set time period for a similar group of people. No physicians would be willing to speak on camera about the connection between environmental factors and cancers. As a matter of fact, there was only one study done in 2010, and when it was given to the state, it was shelved. So I decided to catch up with Stel Bailey at fightforzero.org, who has spent the last few years tracking cancer clusters and bringing attention to them, succeeding where the state failed. In 2013, uh, my uncle, our family dog, my brother, who was 21 years old, myself and my father were all diagnosed with cancer. My brother and I fought the same exact cancer, which is Hodgkin's lymphoma, it's a blood cancer. Our uncle and our dog passed away, and my father is still fighting bone cancer. And you know, of course, everybody goes to the, oh, it's genetic, and you know, it must run in your family. We have no family history of cancer. Our case was so unique, we were invited to get genetic testing done, and the genetic testing showed that we had no mutating genes. So what that usually means is that it's environmentally caused. Of course, that, that started me on my journey. So in 2014, I began this whole just crowdsourcing effort. And from that time frame until about 2018, I just continued to research, collect information. I collected anything I could. Everybody called me crazy. They said, our water's fine. You're just paranoid. Just because your family got cancer doesn't mean it was caused by something. You know, you always hear those typical things. We're finding that there's homes that have had, this is an example, somebody had lymphoma. They moved, sold that home, and the next homeowner's child had lymphoma. Wow. And we're finding that not just with one home. We're finding that in several cases where people have moved from that exact home and it's a totally different family and they're getting diagnosed with similar cancers. And that's when we decided, let's do water testing in those areas. Let's do environmental testing in those areas. And that's when we found, we started finding stuff in the water. So we can kind of connect, you know, is it environment and health? It's always about environmental health. And so I created the map because I wanted to uh, give us that vision and to be able to look and, and, and see. When I started getting up into the 400 mark and then the 800 diagnosed um, in one little zip code, like one little area, I started to wonder, is this normal? And I even called the Department of Health and they tried to tell me, yeah, because I said, is it normal for whole families and neighbors to be getting diagnosed around the same time with similar cancers? And, and they're like, yeah, that's normal. People get cancer. I got cancer, you know? So it was just like a really odd response to a concern that we had. And we're, we're crowdsourcing this data and we're, we're seeing why is, isn't the, the state seeing this information? Why are, you know, what are they doing with our data? Because they're required the doctors are required to send in all of our cancer diagnoses to the state. So hmm. what exactly are they doing with that data? I mean, for me, I think that's really important information to take into consideration for the health and safety of communities across the entire state of Florida. I was really surprised when Stell was talking about the Department of Health's reaction. I mean, they define themselves as a department that is there to prevent disease of environmental origin. So I decided to take the water test we had done and go visit the Department of Health myself. I wanted to see what they thought about the water test results, talk about the Geiger counter results, see what tests or protections are available for citizens, and what the state is doing with all these cancer diagnoses. And it turns out the Department of Health is on a park property where Mosaic had paid for all the renovations. And although phosphate is natural for our bodies, too much of it, like the levels we found in the test that we ran, can cause kidney damage and osteoporosis. I was interested in finding out some more about the water samples. Do you guys have anything that tests for radiation? We um, have another test for lead and nitrate. Lead and nitrate? No. Uh, do, you, do you have to do any uh, phosphate testing? Or? Yeah, lead and nitrate. Thank you, I appreciate that. So we've been taking water samples and found incredible levels of phosphate. Because a lot of people, a lot of citizens here are concerned, especially in DeSoto, 
um, you know, with the possibility of the mines coming in. Okay, well, maybe you can help me. The, the reason that I'm curious, um, I've been working on a documentary about uh, what's happening here and if the mining is having any effect on public health. Public relations, please. Public relations, okay. Okay, thank you. I think it's interesting that as soon as I mentioned mining, I went to the PR person. How are you? Hi, yes, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm Pamela Graham. I'm the Division Director for Environmental Health. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Pamela. Now, without permission. Just a quick question for you. Please leave. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. It had become really obvious that the state and Mosaic work together. There's a cancer in the body politic, and the watchdog for the industry has now become a, their guard dog. New developments in a breaking aid on your side investigation. A big apology from Mosaic to its neighbors, the community, and Polk County for keeping a contaminated little secret. So why the big case of we're sorry? Well, for failing to timely notify people living near its new wells plant in Mulberry of a sinkhole that sucked hundreds of millions of gallons of radioactive water into the aquifer. Senior investigative reporter Steve Andrews broke the story last week. He's back tonight with an important update that includes that overdue apology. At this point today, this hole is getting bigger. It's widening. It appears as though the walls are eroding, cracking, separating. It looks as though it's about to collapse. Now, Florida's Department of Environmental Protection claims it's all over this, but the guardians of our environment have been dead silent about this, all of this, from the get-go. Polk County officially became aware of this sinkhole September 9th. It failed to notify the public, too. Did you do enough? As far as notifying our constituents, the, um, the problem is, what do you tell them? Uh, you know, uh, we had... Uh, Possible danger coming your way? Commissioners I've spoken with feel it was up to Mosaic to make news of the sinkhole and aquifer contamination public. Well, constituents don't elect Mosaic. They elect you folks to the county commission. And the county commissioners, as far as I know, or Polk County government didn't let the public know. Mm -hmm. It's your responsibility, isn't it? Um, morally, yes. Tallahassee today, DEP, the agency responsible for guarding our environment, couldn't whisk Deputy Director Gary Clark away fast enough from our Mike Vasilinda. We can set something up later. No, you for haven't. That. We've tried to reach you for three or four days, and you don't return our calls, <laughs> and you are avoiding this again. I just don't understand why you don't want to say we made a mistake. I like to know what that guy's chuckling about, first of all. Do they knowingly poison us? It's known. It's, uh, the DEP knows it. The EPA knows it. Everybody knows it. They let these phosphate companies police themselves. They have their own environmental crew that tests the stacks, the scrubbers, the waterways. And then they report to the state. The state don't have anybody watching over them. And so it just depends on honesty. Mm. And usually when you have money and honesty, you know, you run into some bad situation. Heck of a lobby down there in Tallahassee. It's hard to get anything done with the phosphate industry. They do just about as they please. And no matter how many protests you have, no matter how many newspaper articles and people raising sand and you know you know if you, you're gonna get a hold of you congressman mm. you know you know that old congressman's probably getting a pretty good check too and aside from local politicians in mining areas they spend a lot on lobbying over four hundred and eighty thousand dollars at ballard partners over eight hundred and thirty thousand dollars on a lobbyist that has one person. And they reach out and get people at the state level that can deregulate. And Rick Scott's a great example. After removing $700 million worth of protection money for Florida's waterways, he then gutted the entire FDEP, replacing it with lobbyists and corporate insiders that normally worked on getting the permits for Mosaic and other corporations. He shrank the permitting process from 44 days down to two days. Scott ordered his new staff 
quote, where noncompliance occurs despite your best efforts at education and outreach, your first consideration should be whether you can bring about a return to compliance without enforcement. This approach started the hands-off of the FDEP and the creation of compliance assistance letters instead of finding the polluters. The DEP actually works with them in order to ensure business continues as usual. One of the doors Rick Scott opened was a revolving door between Hopping Green and Sam's, which is Mosaic's lawyers and the FDEP. And I actually got to see the relationship between Mosaic and the state firsthand. Norma Killebrew had called me and asked if she could use one of the water reports that we had got from the mine to give to John Coates from the FDEP because Mosaic was trying to renew a permit. Turns out John Coates actually called the lab. When I heard this, I reached out to the lab myself and they confirmed that John Coates had contacted them and they had told John Coates that they do not look at the source of the water sample in order to get a true reading. John Coates then writes to Norma that he has spoken with the program director who indicated they did not know the sample was collected from surface water and their test is designed for reporting radon exclusively from drinking water samples. He said this test is simply not applicable. So once John Coates was able to discredit the high radon level of that report, he was then able to give a generic answer back to Norma and approve the permit for Mosaic after all. Now, a little bit up the food chain from John Coates is Adam Blaylock. Now, Adam Blaylock used to be a Mosaic lawyer. Now he's the FDEP deputy secretary, and he is in charge of all five state water management districts, water supply planning, water use permitting, and he oversees ecosystem restoration, which in mining is called reclamation. Uh, I fought it and fought it and fought it and did what I could, and I still am. I still believe it. I still believe in doing all we can to try to get all this stuff cleaned up and get our environment cleaned up, our air cleaned up, and our workers protected. But uh, it's an uphill battle. It's an uphill battle. And, uh, you know, until uh, we get representatives up there in Washington and, and Tallahassee in our state that uh, don't take the money and buy the bullshit, uh, that's what it is. It's bullshit. What's Reclamation Ecology? Come on, I'll show you. This is Reclamation Ecology! And this, and that. Mosaic is a global leader in the science of Reclamation Ecology. And we're putting it to work, right here at home. Innovative environmental technology, natural habitat for native wildlife, and sometimes reviving streams that haven't existed for a century. That's the science of stewardship, the science of Mosaic. When Mosaic's applying for permits in different counties, they have to submit what's called a reclamation plan. And this is the idea that when they're done mining, they're gonna put the land back to use and turn it into nature. So in essence, in their philosophy, they're only borrowing the land to extract the minerals and then return it as was, and sometimes even better. The reality is far different than that. A lawsuit filed in federal court claims developers in Polk County failed to notify thousands of new homeowners that they are living on contaminated land. The lawsuit claims no one, including Drummond, notified the plaintiff or class members of the significantly elevated cancer risks posed by the presence of radon gas, gamma radiation, or concerns raised by the federal EPA. It goes on to say, in 1975, the EPA administrator informed the governor of Florida that the EPA had found elevated levels of radiation in buildings constructed on land reclaimed from phosphate mining areas and recommended that construction of new buildings on phosphate mining lands be discouraged. And in 2020, two more communities sued after being built on reclaimed land and a lot of the tenants getting cancer. We visited a community built on old mining land two blocks away from the communities that are suing currently. And you would have no idea how radioactive it is on these lands. How many homes have already sold in the neighborhood? Ten. Ten? And not only are family homes built on former mines, but so are public parks. This is one of the more popular ones, Hardy Lakes Park. These were the first lakes in Hardy County, public lakes. Uh, it, it's a great place for the public to come out and come fishing. We got 1,200 acres, 
there's four lakes. We have 60 RV sites, playground, and there's a 1,200-foot boardwalk that goes across the conservation area. The horses come out here and ride now, and they can, and a couple of pavilions around for picnicking. Mosaic and Fort Green community, they go tie and tie, I think, with any kind of community that Mosaic is around. We've had first birthdays here, and this pavilion even made it more exciting to have second and third and fourth and fifth birthdays here. So it really gives a good opportunity for the community to come out and get together and to share what reclamation can be like, and not many people know that it's reclamation. Not many people know that it's reclamation? I think this is really the problem. They dig up all the fields, becomes radioactive, they place dirt back on top of it, and then turn them into public areas with no notification about the possible side effects of radiation. And one of the interesting signs here is you can see that all the trees are at the exact same level. When they reclaim land, they plant the trees at the same time. Now, aside from just covering the land with some dirt and planting trees at the same time, they also bring in what's called reject rock from the mines. And this is the rock that's left over when they pull the phosphate out of the ground and separate it from the uranium. So once Mosaic has this radioactive rock, they can't sell it. They give it to the counties who then use it, adding it to roads. And I've heard of a famous rock pile here in Hardy Lakes Park that the kids like to plant. Oh my god, there's wow. fucking kids playing in it. Oh, what? Oh my gosh. Okay. Alright. I'm going. There we go. All I'm doing is let's wait for the truck. We weren't really surprised to see the white truck following us still. But we wanted to let him go by before we jumped out with the Geiger counters. With children playing on this rock pile, we had to know how radioactive it was. And 100 is the maximum recommended safe limit for exposure. We were already over 240. At this level of radiation, these kids have a very high probability of getting cancer. Maybe not just from one visit, but from repeated exposure. This is one of the highest level of CPMs we've seen since we've had the Geiger counter out. So we are, uh, this right behind me are all the rocks that they bring from the mines. And we just tested them and they're reading over 450. Um, so, and these children have been playing here. To hide, sewer is high blinking. My hope is that we could get them to remove this. This is not natural here. They brought this here from the mine. It's rejected rock that fell off the side while they were getting it loaded or whatever through the process. They didn't want it, so they load it here as a dump site. This is not natural. This is not good road. It's on all these roads, all the campsites, at the um, boat ramp. It's at the playground. You know, it's at the store at Four Corners. So. If they get, they can remove this to lower the um, radiation levels here, then you know it's be all right. But they're just ignoring it. They're not doing anything. They came out here to the health department. Some experts came out here. They see that it's high levels of radiation, yet they don't. They just kind of like, you know, ignore it or or say no, it's all right, just rocks or whatever. But um, you know, highly radioactive. <laughs> according to the Geiger counter that the expert had and the health department. So this is the same one they use and it's the same readings. And Come on, check it out. This is a Geiger counter. 
These rocks come from the phosphate mining companies yeah. and they dump them here. Mosaic. Yeah. Mosaic, yeah. So look at this. We're already up to 280. 100. Yeah. Is anything over 100 dangerous prolonged yeah. exposure? How are you? Yeah. Okay. That's crazy. We wanted to bring it down and test this area because everyone camps here. I mean, what is, like, what, what is it? Like, like long Look at this. Exposure? Almost to 400. I mean, even... Wow. Yeah. That's intense. There's yeah. a whole rock pile. Yeah. And the kids play in it, right? Yeah, yeah. all the yeah. time. They yeah, call no, it rock yeah, hill. No, we no. just went to the rock pile and measured over 450. Yeah. The kids always play in that thing. Yeah. I always see kids in there. could not believe what I've seen. Every single place we went and put a Geiger counter down or every place that we took a water sample from had cancer causing levels. The people in Florida are actually fighting a few cancers. The first being the disease, which still remains the number one cause of death in Florida. And the second is that mosaic moves like cancer. Once it's used up the resource, it has to expand for its own survival. But the third one may be the deadliest of all the cancer of the body politic. The people that were regulating our polluters have now joined them, and every day they allow cancers that can be stopped to continue to happen. And as our only defense has eroded away, we pay the price with our health. And with Mosaic and the state having such a cozy relationship, the only people that could step in were the federal EPA. But when the EPA started to be run by a former coal lobbyist, they actually deregulated all water protections, leaving the people in Florida to fend for themselves. But this problem is bigger than Florida. It's not only nationwide, it's worldwide. 24 hours a day, factories are pumping cancer-causing chemicals into local waterways, all with the government's approval. And over one billion people a year pay the price by getting a chronic illness. And even though a lot of these polluters are multinationals, the way they do business can be forced to change by the voice of the citizens. And although it's a worldwide issue, it requires local solutions. And the people of Florida are the most amazing example of that. Testing the waters, going to meetings, becoming a unified voice to fight for a cleaner future for the next generation. And with childhood cancer rates up 30% since the 1970s and access to clean water disappearing day by day. Local communities have stood up to these giants and taken their environment back. And joining this worldwide movement is easy. It begins when you ask the simple question, what's in my water? Hello, everybody. Thank you. Um, wow, that was an impressive, impressive movie. Um, all right, so we're going to get into our panel um, very, very shortly. 
Um, Andy is here. Let me make you a co-host so that way you can turn your screen off or on, excuse me. Um, real quick, I want to take just a moment for that to, uh, I want to I wanna give us a, a moment of silence for all of the victims um, that have cancer diagnosis and other health effects due to the poisoning that is in our water due to these phosphate companies. Thank you very, very much. Um, so uh, in the Environmental Caucus, we've been working on this issue. Um, we've had multiple chapters from across the state. We have 24 total chapters. Um, we have mosaic uh, mining in at least six or seven of them. So it is a statewide issue, obviously, but we uh, got, we were working with Sarasota who passed a resolution. We have since um, at the state level also passed a resolution I'm gonna share that real quick and give you our uh, top line items, just so everybody knows where we stand as a caucus on these issues. Um, we have a, can everybody see my screen? Yes, good. Um, we passed a resolution to protect Florida's waters from phosphate mining. We have a lot of actual data, um, and but ultimately due to things like this film, um, we came to the resolution that we are opposing new or expanded phosphate mining until these mines are truly safe and environmentally sustainable, if they ever can be. Um, that there is sufficiently increased bond insurance to adequately cover the costs <clears throat> of inevitable failures, whether due to poor management, weak regulations, or natural events. That the, legislator, the legislature should fund solutions to environmental degradation caused by phosphate mining and improvement of best management practices that include sustainable outcomes. Uh, we insist on a clean closure of existing sites with remediation goals that include returning disturbed mining sites to equal or better environmental and habitable conditions, not just papering over them, but actually healing them. And that the state law prohibits the discharge of reclaimed water high in nitrogen into Florida's coastal waters. Thank you. Great. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Eric. Um, actually, I guess I got to introduce everybody um, and give you your, your proper props on your bios. Um, bear with me one second. Um, so thank you for, for watching the film. Um, I'm going to put in chat um, a link to donate and get involved. I assume everybody can hear me, right? Yeah. Um, I'm going to put in chat a link for everybody uh, to, to yes, donate to Sarasota. Um, and we'll go into the speaker introductions and then we'll kick off with Eric. Uh, Jessica Arman is the president of the Environmental Caucus of Sarasota County. She's a true native of the Sarasota area. She is raised on the barrier island of Siesta Key and her family has been pioneers of Sarasota's arts, music, education, real estate and medical fields since the 1950s. Jessica has been a prominent figure in the real estate communities of Sarasota, Manatee and Charlotte County since 1998. A uh, realtor with Premier Sotheby's International Realty. She has been recognized by Sarasota's Magazine for eight years as a five-star real estate agent, best in client satisfaction, a graduate of Emerson College in Boston. Jessica earned a Bachelor of Arts in Mass Communication and went on to complete her master's degree in international relations from Boston University. She served as an intern in the economic section of the U.S. Embassy in Berlin, Germany, and worked for the Discovery Channel as part of the International Network Operation Unit responsible for the channel's worldwide launch. Eric Crown, and she also put this together. She helped me put this together big time. I have tremendous, tremendous appreciation. Um, <clears throat> our, our director, producer, and filmmaker, Eric Crown, uh, award-winning documentary filmmaker, focused on eco and animal rights-based projects. He began working in production at the age of 13 with his father's company and becoming a professional film editor at the age of 16. He attended New York University where he studied film. Eric has worked on a variety of independent and Hollywood projects, including NBC's Scrubs and TMZ. After, I think I might've seen you in one of those. Um, <laughs> after learning he has an incurable cancer that cannot be treated, he changed his focus to documentary filmmaking, driven to investigate the environment that had made him sick. He has made documentaries investigating illegal pet trade in the Amazon rainforest, illegal fishing in South China, 
and corporate waste pollution causing cancer in the U.S. He is certified in plastic pollution management from the UN Environmental Program, and aside from his work in documentaries, he runs a weekly podcast examining international issues called The, Con the Conservation Conversation. It's a good twi uh, tongue twister, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, we also have uh, Walter Smith, who is an environmental engineer at W.L. Smith & Associates Environmental Consultants, Consulting. He's a community advocate, broadcast journalist, and a 21-year veteran in the field of environmental engineering. He is an expert in matters involving environmental impact policies and their application to matters of global resilience. Mr. Smith graduated from Florida A&M University with a B.S. in civil engineering. He currently is the principal consultant of W.L. Smith & Associates. He is currently organizing, <clears throat> excuse me, he is currently the organizing representative for the Sierra Club's Beyond Coal campaign and is the founder and chairman of the Tampa Bay Disaster Resiliency Initiative. As a broadcast journalist, he hosts NPR's weekly radio show, The Sunday Forum, on WMNF 88.5, and also a good friend of mine, a wonderful, wonderful gentleman, though I don't always let him hear it. Um, is Steele with us? Yes, Steele is, Steel is with us. Uh, we have Steele Bailey, Chief Executive Director at Fight for Zero. Uh, she's a co-facilitator of the National PFAS Contamination Coalition and a recognized environmental health advocate who has worked as an assistant environmentalist collecting samples and gathering critical data. In 2013, when her father, brother, and family dog, uncle, and she was diagnosed with cancer without any family history, their case being so unique, they had to have genetic testing, which showed no mutation genes, indicating they did not have an increased risk for developing the disease. Um, she started, she began to crowdsource cancer case, cases in her hometown on the Space Coast. So, and, and I believe that uh, bio, that short bio was in her, her in the film. Um, and we have, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, as she spoke out about her family's cases, she connected with others affected by diseases in unusual ways. Bailey became passionate about clean water, toxic exposures, the environment, and disease prevention. Her powerful testimony of overcoming illness and losing her family to preventable diseases have given her an influential platform to educate others. I need to unmute you as well. I'm so sorry. Okay, like the co-host. Now you should be able to turn your camera on. Um, and, and our last panelist is uh, Mr. Andy Mele. He is a master's degree. He's the executive director at Peace and Micaiah River Waterkeepers. He's a master degree in environmental science, concentrated in envir environmental economics and policy. He is the author of Polluting for Pleasure, the book that led directly to the extinction, extinction of 12 million cycle outboard motors, ending annual discharges into American waterways of 50 million gallons of oil and gasoline from ple pleasure boats. He was executive director of Clearwater, the Hudson River Environmental Group formed by folk singer Pete Seeger in 1966 and won the 30 year battle with uh, GE over its massive PCB spill in the Hudson. He was recently executive director of Suncoast Waterkeeper working for protection of coastal ecosystems to halt phosphate strip mining and untrampled development in Florida and to bring red tide back to pre-development levels. He served in the US Navy from 1968 to 1971 and he previously ran a wooden boat building company for 18 years. Thank you so much for the panelists being here. Unfortunately, uh, Nikki did have um, a last minute uh, conflict but she did record for us um, a video that I will play. Um, momentarily, if I can get this done correctly. Um, and then we'll hear her video and then we'll go right into um, the forum. Just one second. Maybe not. <laughs> I think I closed the wrong file. All right, um, we'll pause on that one. Um, so I will start by saying um, phosphate says a lot of things. A lot of us have wanted to say for many years. Eric Crown has done an excellent job of exposing the deviousness and duplicity of Mosaic, 
Although uh, 3PR and the DECF cannot endorse this film as there are concerns of claims made we don't believe can be proven as of yet. Uh, water quality impact is likely the most important issue to the public concerning phosphate mining and fertilizer production. Um, you know, the, the, there's just this small little lane um, where the science isn't, you know, that's, that's the excuse. They, they always make this excuse in between this little detail um, or they sue you if you if you go beyond that little that little detail. Um, however, this this movie is clearly a very impactful film, highlighting the misleading ads that Mosaic shows to the public and setting them side by side with the real picture of phosphate mining devastation and ultimate ruin. He shows how Mosaic bribes small counties to ingrate, ingratiate themselves into the community ahead of mining. He raises the question of increased radioactivity at former mining sites, which is something that Mosaic has never adequately addressed. The filming itself is unmatched and a and a first feature length documentary to show the true picture of this so far well-kept secret in Florida's hinterlands. All right, Eric, with that, um, please go ahead. Um, everybody should be able to unmute themselves and turn their cameras on. And um, let me change the view to the gallery view. So that way uh, the viewers can see us all. All right. All right, we should all be able to unmute and share our screens or discuss. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, first of all, I wanted to say thank you for having this screening and allowing this to become a larger conversation. You know, I think there's so many groups and, and so many activists and so many approaches trying to fight for the same type of future. And it's nice to see the unity and everybody being able to come together and talk about ways that we can make changes. Um, you know, I, I saw somebody had asked, well, how do we, where do we go, you know, from here? Um, before we get into even bigger topic ideas, uh, remember that there is a revote in 2023 in DeSoto County. Um, and on our website and on the Facebook page, we're gonna be having the um, information so you can contact the county commissioners and let them know your thoughts on phosphate mining. Um, so one thing we can do is try to stop Mosaic from expanding into DeSoto in 2023. It's a tangible thing. It's within our grasp. Um, DeSoto already did it once. It's not a vote. It's, it's a revote. So I just wanted to throw that out there as one thing that we can all work together on uh, to make changes. That is very important uh, as a call to action. Um, can, can Jessica, uh, you wanna say a couple of things or Steele if you're with us and, and available um, on really acknowledging the problems that we face um, to actually accomplish some of this stuff. What, what is the problem with Mosaic? There's a lot that they do in building up fertilizer and, and getting that out overseas for people to get food and things like that, but put a little bit of meat on the bones if you would. Would you like me to address that? I don't think I see Shell um, having her microphone on or photo. Um, I'm 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 one minute from my house, so I'll be right on in just okay, one wonderful. minute. Well, okay. Okay. I guess I'll take this question, but I'll also turn it over to Andy Mele, who was instrumental in leading the community's efforts to get the no vote in the first place. So uh, basically, you have to kind of do what Andy and I and a couple of other friends of ours. Do you know, did you have to work on campaigns, you have to try and get new leadership uh, in office. And, you know, you need to get people to realize, you know, the economy of Florida is the environment and the environment of Florida is the economy it's sort of interchangeable. And um, that is kind of the aim of our organization is to raise awareness and to help, um, you know, get people to run who are environmentally um, active and believe that, you know, that's that important to guard it. And, you know, we have to affect change and get people elected. So, and we will be doing a lot of different things. I'll speak more to it, but uh, perhaps the best person because they have gotten this done, not only up in the Hudson River, you know, with his background, um, you know, kind of slaying the uh, Goliath, you know, David versus, versus Goliath uh, effort. Um, is, is Andy. So Andy, would you like to have a couple words about what you think uh, might happen in 2023? Because it's my understanding that instead of doing this piecemeal, they will 
throw this whole thing into one enchilada and get a vote revote on it. Correct? Yeah. Thanks, Jessica. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> what's going to happen in 2023 is that uh, with the um, with the call it leadership of their county attorney, Don Kahn, no relation to Russ, uh, they're going to be um, considering these five people, none of whom are the sharpest tools in the shed, and I'm sure they would all be the first to admit that. But all five, you know, I mean, I couldn't consider all this stuff. They're gonna, there's three elements to this. There's the rezone, which is pretty deep, but it's basically the same as the rezone argument was a couple of years ago. It's basically, you know, there are 15 uh, criteria for meeting the requirements for a rezone in DeSoto County and phosphate mining met maybe five of them and the rest of them, it did not, it completely did not meet. And I fail to see what's gonna change. The only thing that's gonna change is that the uh, county commissioners will probably be ready for this one. They're being worked on constantly daily by Mosaic. Um, the second piece is there's gonna be a mastermind plan, which is sort of the overarching, you know, uh, action plan for uh, this 20,000 plus acre mine. And then there's going to be a, an operating permit, which will let them start, you know, burning off all the animals and the plants and all the native Florida habitat and the rangeland and everything else that, that they're that they're going to be just destroying up there. Um, I am. Um, I, I've sort of stepped away from my sort of conventional approach, which is, you know, to keep trying to work on the. Um, the, the, the court of public opinion to keep trying to get stuff out in front of the press and everything like that. I've gone, I've gone under the radar and I'm working with a group of people who will just have to remain nameless and everything at this point. And we are, um, we're working on building a database that will provide um, a really strong scientific basis so let's let's go from there and talk about some of the solutions and goals. Um, so well, I was working for that. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. kind of that's kind of where we're going. Um, that you you're not right quite at the liberty to uh, to say. Um, that's true. I'm not. So so from from the rest of the panelists, what do you guys see as as what we should level set and goal to find these solutions? Where 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 do we go from here? Actually. You know, what, what's the, what okay. Stella thinks about that, because Stella has, has uh, had some success in being able to change how communities and statewide water is treated and communities are, are, uh, are treated and, and heard, so. Yeah, I mean, I so I focus a lot on the science and the data and data drives change um, on both the local, state and federal level. And so I think we really need to start embracing science um, on, on a local level as citizens and as organizations and start getting the data because we've relied too much on the polluters to do that for us. And um, when we started embracing that and, and doing that part of the work and crowdsourcing cancer cases and autoimmune diseases, and we started seeing these hotspots and we were able to call out the Department of Health and ask them, you know, why is it that communities have the burden of proof why do we have to come to the department and ask them to to investigate these communities and their health concerns you guys collect this data already and we have such advances in technology why are we not using that and so i think you know part of the solution is data getting on the department of health um, to fulfill their role in the health aspect of all of this and how people are being affected by phosphate mining and other pollution in the state of florida you know even when it comes down to blue green algae we've seen this you know where they're, they're studying it and so we, we need a lot more data and we need a lot more uh, studies when it comes to the health the human health impact of this and so we're working 
with the solutions on both the state and federal level, trying to get new legislation introduced and uh, pushing for better health protective standards on a state level um, and with the Safe Drinking Water Act, which hasn't been revised for decades. And so we need to really focus on that on a federal level to help safeguard our families and our children from drinking these uh, potentially really toxic contaminants that need more studies from the EPA and other government agencies. Very, very well said. Uh, anybody wanna add anything to that? I think she did hit exactly uh, quite well. Um, now, when we talk about asking the legislature, uh, we are all Floridians. Um, and we have some previous candidates as well. So I think we kind of unfortunately are set a little bit, um, you know, in opposition because the legislature doesn't seem to want to act. And I think part of the mission here that we have um, is to work across the aisle. I, I know there were people in the film, Eric, you can definitely comment to that. Um, you know, of across the aisle. This isn't just a Democrat or a Republican thing. Eric, please go ahead and tell us about some of that, some of the yeah, strange yeah. bedfellows. That's a really, yeah, <laughs> no, that, that's a great point. That was the one thing that I really found that was amazing is that no matter what people's political view is, they all see that this is important to their family, to their health, to their friends, to their relatives, and to their future. So that sort of disperses the whole political thing. You know, we always say, don't look at the environment through your political party's talking points. Instead, judge every politician through the lens of the environment. And that is what we need to do as we move forward because we need to rethink about how people are delivering on their promises and what promises they're making to us because, you know, we, we need them to become part of the process. You know, Mosaic is, is a uh, in my eyes, at least a, a big problem for cancer and for a lot of other issues. And we need them to come out and talk to us as well. So I think the more visible we can make things and the more out in the open we can talk about these, these topics, you know, they're always trying to hush everything, <clears throat> then the bigger chance we have of, of creating a unity across both sides. Because yeah, well, like I said, once, you know, once it becomes about your family's health, I mean, one in three people are gonna get cancer in the United States. Think about your family, think about how big that is and think about what kind of odds that gives everybody. We need to change this. We can stop some of these environmental cancers and we have the opportunity to do that, so. Well, and I know Walter works in um, frontline communities on, on the regular, um, on a regular basis. Walter, did you have anything to add on that? I do, you know, can, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, you know, I've listened to every, everyone here and uh, in watching the the documentary, which was very well done, Eric, I, kudos to you uh, and the work that you've done. And I'm so sorry for the whole, your, your condition. But let me tell you, um, I used to, I not only work in the frontline communities, but I've also worked for Mosaic as a contractor. And everywhere I saw exactly what you were talking about and I knew about it from Mulberry when you were talking about Mulberry and those areas there. And I worked all along those areas um, as, a, as a private contractor um, to know some of the devastation that these people have caused. Uh, it is inexcusable to me that as Stell said, that the public health, the agencies of public health have not been involved in resolving this issue is inexcusable, absolutely inexcusable. The mere fact that that they have the ability to go out to community, knowing that these things are happening, knowing they're happening, and to come out with, with proof evident to show the connection between the illnesses that have taken place in these frontline communities or in any community for that matter, but in frontline communities and what the, the production is or the effluent of what's, what they're, what they're releasing from those properties into the waterways right now is absolutely criminal, absolutely criminal. If, let, let me tell you, the legislature, for instance, uh, being what it is right now structurally, the legislature right now muddies the water, pardon the pun, but it literally muddies the water. This is not a Republican or Democratic thing. 
this is a human thing. We have got to begin to look at this thing from that from that perspective and begin to hold these people accountable for the human rights violations that they are continuing to commit. What they are doing is criminal and they know it. And because we know it, we need to start bringing these people to account for what they are truly doing, what they are truly doing. You know, and, and, I, and I'll stop here in just a minute. Uh, the bottom line is there was a time period where you had people in the civil rights movement um, uh, that wanted to bring America to uh, to account for, for human rights violations, right? And America knew what it was doing. It knew what it was doing. And there were people who were assassinated for, for threatening to bring this to the United Nations. And I'm gonna tell you right now, this right here is criminal and is at that level. They are destroying this state and they are killing people. And that is inexcusable. And that's, that's what I have to say on that topic. Thank you, uh, Andy. I completely agree with what he's saying. Uh, I think the day has passed for us to, you know, try to play footsie with the FDOH and the FDEP. They are not working for us. They're working for themselves. Their jobs are nothing more than to massage public opinion and make it lull everybody into a false sense of security. We need to get around them. We need to fight them with everything we have. Take them to the United Nations. Take them wherever we need to go and get around this whole thing, get around DeSantis, get around. The legislature is a disaster. It's, it's, yeah, well, anyhow, that's what I, that's what I think we need to get around them. Yeah. And just um, for the jugular. Yeah, there, there is a lot, a lot of people to take to task. Um, and I, I wish I had a woodshed, if you know what I mean. Um, because there, there are plenty of people that have responsibility over the past 30, 40, 50 years to lead, leading us to this degradation and this point. Um, I guess what, Jessica, what do you think we should be doing? Where, what's our call to action? What can we do to stop Mosaic right now, right today? What, well, what can we do? Well, you're, you're in the right spot because you watch this movie. So first you have to identify that you have a problem. I mean, most people would rather just live in denial because it's a lot easier to take than this reality. In 2018, having grown up on the Gulf Coast and lived here for most of my 50, about 52 years now, uh, you know, I saw this happen with my own eyes. I never, in 2018, we had a red tide and then we had a green tide. And I went looking for answers, like, where does this come from? Where does this cyanobacteria, all this crap? So a bunch of girls and I, we went sort of paying to sample water and send it out of state and get answers to our questions. And it actually gave us more questions than answers. And I went to speak with our then water keeper, Andy Maley, um, quite a few times to try and see if we can test some of this water. So I'm so glad that this film did this and that the citizen scientists, unfortunately, have to be the civil servants of the state because I find the civil servants of the state are neither civil nor serving in that they're not doing their job. And so we need to take them to task. But I kind of, kind of arriving, listening to Mr. Maley and, and really appreciating his knowledge on the subject, I have to say that I think he's probably doing it right and just overstepping these people. I went to the office of Mr. James Buchanan um, last week and he told me he didn't know anything about the Soto mines or anything. And I find that a little hard to believe seeing that, you know, he gets money um, from Mosaic probably. And I'm for sure his father who was a cameo in this movie, um, not a cameo, but I saw a clip with him. Sorry, I, I, I need to regress from saying that. But um, so, you know, you can join a caucus like ours, um, you know, you can join a beach protest, uh, you can sign important petitions for, um, you know, different things uh, like we have here. Um, let me see. Uh, you can attend a meeting uh, in DeSoto or Manatee counties and just show up. But, you know, I've done all these things and I resent going there because I have to take off a day from work. And basically the takeaway is, you know, they get hours to talk and we get two minutes and I didn't even bother speaking the last time. But if I had to get up there, I would tell them that I resent that we're there. And I would tell them that there's three issues I take with this. Number one, <clears throat> you know, you're wasting our time with this. And when is no, no, we've already gone through this exercise. We had a resounding four to one no against expansion. Number two, uh, you know, you could really just bet, wait, save everybody's time and just get in a bus 
charter a bus and go to Polk County and go visit all these places, then you'll know how your town's gonna look. Number, number three, while it may be legal to discharge these waters, is it moral and is it ethical, especially when a million, potentially a million Floridians get their drinking water supply from the Peace River? And fourth and probably most pertinent to the conversation for the folks uh, you know, um, in Arcadia, which I've been going there since I'm knee high to a grasshopper, and yes, I can speak like that because I was brought up here, is you know, it's a way of life that is going to be totally destroyed. And this town represents, you know, our oldest industries, uh, citrus farming and, and cattle ranching. So there's all these issues. And those are the three takeaways that I take from that. And um, okay, Andy, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sure you Jessica, you're, you sound great. You're completely right. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to say uh, one thing. Uh, in the early days, the, the early days of the Clean Water Act, uh, the legislative intent was to never, ever have in America another industrial sewer like, for instance, the Hudson River had been. And that was clearly the legislative intent of the Clean Water Act. Today, the Peace River is in stark violation of that legislative intent every single step of the way. It is an industrial sewer, nothing less. And the, the, the Peace River uh, Minnesota Regional Water Supply Authority is there valiantly trying to suck up a few drops of water and treat it and treat it and treat it and treat it and, and you know, give us, give us clean water. But the fact is that uh, the FDEP and the FDOH and all of them are in complete and total violation of the Clean Water Act, the Federal Clean Water Act, and they should have their um, delegated Clean Water Act authorities revoked. That would be a delicious solution to this problem. Yeah, I think one of the other things is, is we all need to have our science degrees, go get jobs at FDEP and literally unionize and strike until they can't operate to even write the dang uh, permits to approve the permits. That might be a good way to get at them. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, I know Walter like that one. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. I, I you know, I started out at DEP. That was, that was like my first job out of college and uh, out of undergrad. And I'm, I'm going to tell you, man, um, it's so out of focus. It is so out of focus. Um, and, and up until fairly recently, so have our organizations. Now I'm very, I'm very happy to see so many of our organizations now shift gears and look at what's most important. And that's the human value of this entire thing. Um, you know, and, and, and then of course, you know, we, we look at Florida, we look at the state of Florida and um, we look at what the, the lies, the lies these people tell are, are incredible. I, I sat there and watched, like I, how would I along with one of my proteges were like the first people down there to Piney Point when it happened. And, I could not believe when two weeks later, the former, the now former secretary of DEP um, said that there was no, understand, I, I, I rewound the, the news reel so I could watch it and make sure I read the quote itself. He said there was no radioactive material that left that stack at Piney Point going into the, into the waterways. I was, I was blown. Mm -hmm. I was blown. I wanted to pick up the phone and call Russ. I wanted to call somebody. I wanted to tell somebody what the hell is this guy talking about? Does he even have a science degree, this guy? I mean, like, uh, it, it, uh, incredible, incredible. There's no way in the hell that you can come up with that and then come up with the concept of saying, well, it'll just dilute, dilute, dilute ra radioactive waste. You're going to dilute radioactive waste. Really? That's right. what we're going to and then we have this giant fish kill off, um, oh, you know, two, two, weeks, two weeks later where people can't even go to the beach without be breathing in toxins. And people um, are trying to figure out where, why, the, why the fish are dead. Uh, they're literally saying, well, we don't know yet why the fish are dead. I'm like, what do you mean? They, they, they got old. They just wanted to take, take a long nap, you know? <laughs> massive heat, radioactive material, massive heat, nitrogen. You do the math. Like, come on. I mean, unbelievable. And the estuary is just, just being tortured right now. Just tortured. Um, so Steele, um, I know you've had a huge amount of health effects. Um, 
can you touch on that a little bit? I mean, the, the personal stories really matter um, as to what Walter was getting at. And I know Eric has, has, has had effects as well, but I, I find your story very, very um, powerful. You want to tell yeah. us a little bit? Yeah. I, I think that's how, you know, Eric and I connect so well when I meet other cancer patients or survivors or caregivers. Um, there's just, there's this connection that's indescribable because we just get what we've gone through or are going through. And so, yeah, in 2013, my, my uncle, family dog, myself, my little brother and my father were diagnosed with cancer. And uh, so we, we went on this journey of no family history at all of cancer. We grew up on Florida's Space Coast, which is on the East Coast of Florida. We call it the Space Coast because that's where shuttles launch right from our backyards. And um, we went, uh, every time I had a doctor's appointment, the doctors would come into the room and they were so intrigued by our case. They would say, where did you grow up? Did you grow up near this? Uh, what kind, you know, was there anything in your drinking water? And it really started making us wonder what is going on here. And so we were offered to do genetic testing and that genetic testing came back that we had no mutation genes which typically can point more towards an environmental factor. So I made it my lifelong mission. Once my oncologist said you're in remission in 2014 to start crowdsourcing cases where I grew up. And so when I started crowdsourcing them, I had people from all across the, the state of Florida that wanted to submit their, their information. You know, they were diagnosed in their twenties. We're not seeing, you know, people that are in a much older you know, age frame, we're seeing lifelong residents getting diagnosed in their 20s. And that's how old I was. And my brother was 21. And all of our friends that have found tumors and had kidney cancer and breast cancer, they're in their early 20s. That is just not normal. <laughs> so yeah, that's a part of my story and why I got onto this journey of environmental health. I really, really was passionate about both the environment, because I learned that we had cancer causing chemicals called PFAS or also known as perfluorinated compounds in our drinking water that came from the Department of Defense site. And it's, it's at every Department of Defense site in the state of Florida. We have some of the highest levels in the nation. So that's affected us. And, and, and you know, phosphate mining is just another piece of that puzzle of what's going on in the state of Florida. All right, um, what we're gonna do, um, if we can, uh, the panelists uh, take a minute to take a look at some of the Q and A's and we, maybe we'll answer a, a two of them live. We're gonna go a little bit long. I think we have a good discussion going. Um, real quick, I'm gonna play uh, the clip from Nikki um, while the panelists answer a couple of Q and A's and pick a couple to answer live. Um, and then we will uh, we'll come back and, and finish the panel up and give everybody some closing time. Good evening, Democrats all across the state of Florida. Good evening, Democrats all across the state of Florida. My name is Nikki Freed. I'm your Florida Commissioner of Agriculture and Consumer Services. I wanted to send a very special shout out to the Democratic Environmental Caucus and to the Sarasota Democratic Caucus for all of the hard work that you have done protecting our environment across the state of Florida and putting on such an exceptional evening. We know we have a lot of work to do. The mining industry has decimated our state. Look what happened out in Piney Point. These are waiting, ticking time bombs. And with one small catastrophic event, hundreds and hundreds of millions of gallons of toxic water filling out in the bays. And each of these other gypsum stacks are the same conditions, just waiting for the opportunity to destroy our environment destroy our ecosystem, our marine life, our economy, and people's way of lives. So having additional attention to this issue is so important, making sure the rest of the state wakes up to what is happening here in our state. As Commissioner of Agriculture, I do not oversee the mining conditions and mining permits in our state, but I've called out DEP and the governor's office for not taking proactive actions to not only clean up the water that is already in all of these stacks, but more importantly, to come up with a game plan. How do we stop this from happening and continuing for generations to come? There's no plan in place. I've asked those questions. I've raised them at cabinet meetings. I've raised them in letters to DEP and to the governor's office with no response. 
We know that if we don't protect our environment today, we won't have it for tomorrow. It's also why that I have written letters to the DEP that we should not be extending any permits to Mosaic. Mosaic is one of the worst environmental actors in the state of Florida and across the country, and I've never been held accountable. I've traveled the state and have listened to so many stories of people on the ground, whether it is city and county commissioners, whether it's people that live into these communities, whether it's activists or general citizens who have seen firsthand the tactics that get used by Mosaic to get their way in politics, to get their way on permitting, and we've got to stop this. DEP is not supposed to be a rubber stamp for these permits. They're supposed to look that there's a plan to protect our environment, and that's just not happening. So we need people like you, and we need documentaries like you're seeing tonight that elevate this issue and bring it to the forefront, that people all across our state understand that this has to stop. If we destroy our environment, there is no going back. There's no fixing it. And the hundreds of millions and billions of dollars that it's going to take to fix the current situation should not be on the backs of the taxpayers. These companies, these companies that have intentionally destroyed our environment are taking good water and moving it around into areas and putting it into other communities once it's dirty. This is our Flint, Michigan, and we need to stand up. We need to stand united and we need to educate the people of our state what is happening so that we can be united and the people of our state finally having a voice at the table to stand up to these polluters that are hurting our environment. So everybody who has been engaged in this war for a very long time, we have a choice. We have a choice in November 2022 to end this corruption, to end the control that Mosaic has had on our state for so many years and decades. So thank you for staying engaged. Thank you for wanting to lend your voice to this cause. And thank you again to our environmental caucuses for continuously being the lead and the voice. We count on you and we thank you. Ooh, Thanks, Nick. Awesome. Thanks, Nikki. So, I mean, that I think I think she said it very, very well, and I appreciate the commissioner um, and and the clarity to for for the for the attendees to know that it's under the governorship who controls the DEP ultimately. So, this is a, a fight of our future in 2022. Um, so, I don't know if did anybody see any uh, good Q and A questions. I know we're short on time, but I'd like to at least answer a couple. Was there any yeah. um, that any of the well, panelists wanted to address? There was one. There was one in particular about uh, if Piney Point had enough money uh, to remediate. Sure. I, I think if I read that correctly, and the answer to that is no, absolutely not. They start out. They start out in April of this year with three million dollars, and then in, and then another fifteen and a half million was given to them. Let me tell you something. That's not. That's 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 not even a drop in the bucket. What they've done is was so devastating. What's happened there is so devastating. Um, there are things that 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 have gone unmentioned over there uh, with Planning Point, and uh, but that, that's only for the stuff that we know about. That's only the stuff that we know about right now. The the devastation um, to our estuaries, you know, to to how do you remediate that? How do you remediate that? What they say is that we can we can uh, use inject deep, deep injection wells as suggested. Are they crazy? Injection wells of that material into our, our aquifer for what exactly? In hopes that it's going to concentrate, uh, that, that it's not, that it's uh, that it's going to uh, dissipate somehow. Yeah, that's exactly that's exactly what they're thinking. Yeah, that and, that's going to dissipate. It's it's amazing to me that they're going to. They're, they're, the proposals to do these deep injection wells, um, you start, they'll, they'll, they'll do it, they'll drop it in, they'll say, oh, the, here's, here's our test case, they'll start doing it, and, but concentrations increase over time. So you might not see the effects of the concentration until 10, 20 years down the road when you start having new cancer clusters. 
because okay. they're going to think it's safe and, and fine because there's not, nothing's going to happen right away because the concentration levels have not gone to that degree. So uh, one of the most important things that we can do, as Jessica had said, is some representatives literally don't know. They don't know better. So whether it's your local county commission that is considering doing deep water injection, whether it's your, uh, your congressperson or whether it's your House re and Senate representatives, get them this video, get them this show, talk to them, explain to them, get them informed, give them good data and real facts and real science-based solutions because the mosaic ads, those are fake news. It's alternative facts. It's, it's Kelly Conway talking about Bowling Green, right? Like legitimately. Um, and and let, let me just say this real quick, Russ, and I don't wanna to take too much time. I know we're on a time crunch here, but let me be clear about this point. As a black man, and I'm gonna be very clear about this point. As a black man, it scares me to death because there is precedence for these people who are in power to turn around and sweep under the rug what they will do to our communities. They will turn right around and they will find a way to dump those waters, which they've already done in our communities and poison us. And then 10 years down the line, nobody, nobody knows because we because somebody has put the magic coin out there that uh, uh, for some other issue that will distract us from what's really happened out there. And they they are guilty, as I told you before, of human rights, but they are they have done racist things, and this is environmental racism left and right. No question about it, that's been done. We need to watch it very carefully. Watch it and watch it very carefully. Um, if you'd like, I'd like to answer uh, a couple of the questions that are here, and uh, and I can answer them pretty. Can phosphate mining be done done sustainably? Well, this industry has been here since the 1880s. You now have the largest company doing this, the largest phosphate mining company. I mean, there's a couple other phosphate mining companies in the state. Don't get me wrong, although you could argue it's antitrust <laughs> in the case of DeSoto County because they're the only ones. Uh, but they own 20% of DeSoto County, FYI. Um, but the answer to that question is no, it's never been a sustainable or clean industry. And certainly the way they're doing it now is not, and it's on steroids because they have so much of our land. Uh, what are our thoughts on the right to clean water Florida five referendum? My understanding um, that at the state level, our organization voted yes to support them. We have done so in Sarasota County with the positive yes to support them. That would be the rights of nature. Um, yeah, Nick, you, you are correct. The state, the state environmental caucus is also supportive of the rights to nature, the mm -hmm. rights to clean water, FL5 referendum. Uh, what does Nikki Freed think about deep well injection? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's my understanding that she's written letters against expanding um, the mine um, over, I think, in Bar is it Bartow or is it New Wales? I think New Wales mine to get to increase their stack. Where the where the um, where the 215 million that we know about gallons of wastewater went into a sinkhole. So they want to add to that. She wrote a letter stating she didn't advocate for that at all. Yep, and um, I think what we will do, um, I will capture all of these because we have 23 open Q and A's. I'm gonna send all of these questions to our panelists. And then what we will do is we will send out, uh, because we have all of your uh, attendees emails and we will send out the answers to these questions for everybody to review. I don't wanna keep everybody on too late. So what we're gonna do is we are gonna wrap up. Um, thank you everybody for attending. I'm gonna give each uh, panelist a minute and then we'll do a last thank you to everybody uh, from the state, okay? so. Give us another five minutes. We're going to go through it. Um, and please, each of the panelists, um, tell us a little bit about what the work you're doing, your organization, how we can support you, how the individuals can get a hold of you if they want to uh, work with your organizations. Um, we'll start with Walter. You want to start with Walter? Huh? Well, you want to go last? <laughs> I'll save the best for last. You want, you want to go last? You can go last. Uh, oh, it's, hey, listen, listen, listen. I just want to say to everybody, I am very glad to, to be in this panel discussion. Um, uh, there's no other place I'd rather be when talking about this issue than right here, right now. Um, I'm very, very happy to see this happen. Eric, again, kudos to you and the work you've been doing. Kudos to everybody out here on this panel for the work they've been doing. Uh, I, have, uh, I have worked 
for over 20 years in this field, dealing with these issues, trying to educate the people of frontline communities about land use, uh, how to redevelop communities effectively, and, and then environmental impacts and how to deal with those uh, pro uh, properly. And the fact that we need to get involved as a vanguard of our own issues in, uh, in our frontline communities. Uh, the, the, currently I'm working with, as, as the organizing representative for, uh, or for uh, Sierra Club with regard to the Beyond Coal campaign, which is an, an arm of the 100% clean energy fight that we have been um, uh, taking on for so long. And uh, we are making, making great headway, very happy about this. Um, and we are taking the fight to Tico uh, to get them to, uh, to actually change over and get that solar energy put in. Uh, we gotta do it. We have to do it. Too many lives have been at stake. Um, I'm also working with, uh, with black and brown communities to make sure that we are in the, as I said before, in the front lines of our own issues. We are usually the ones who are at the top of the list whenever we talk about impacts, health impacts that happen to our communities, and we can no longer afford to have to have other people speak for us when it comes to these issues. We've got to be on the front line of those issues right here, right now. So we're standing 10 toes down, boots on the ground, ready to go right now. Thanks, Walter. Uh, Steele? Stell. Um, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Uh, it's okay. Um, so I just want to thank you guys for having me on this and, and a part of this discussion panel. I really appreciate it. And so um, Fight for Zero, how you guys could help us is we're in the middle of numerous projects. And one of the main projects that we've been working on for nearly eight years is crowdsourcing cancer and autoimmune diseases. So if you know somebody with a cancer diagnosis or autoimmune disease, um, they could go to our website, fight the number four and zero spelled out dot org, and they could submit that information. And we are working on a map that doesn't identify people, but it's going to put uh, their their diagnosis and their age on the map. And we also have a pollution map. So if you want to take a look at that and you see any missing data, if you know of a pollution site, let us know so we can add it to that map. We also have a project where we're testing fish for toxins and we're trying to expand that. So keep an eye out for that. And we have numerous other ones where we're buying water kits. So we have them on hand to send them out to people. I drove out to Arcadia. Um, we've been out in that area helping get radiation testing done on people's wells and their drinking water. So we could, we would really appreciate the help there as well. So we're really just trying to collect data, embrace the science. We're working together with the University of Florida and scientists, epidemiologists, toxicologists, biostatisticians to really get this work done and to be able to um, have that, that clear understanding of what could possibly be happening in these different areas of Florida. And again, thank you guys so much. Thank you. Uh, Andy? Yeah, well, you probably won't hear much from me for of any substance for about another two years. And then I hope it will be explosive and fantastic. Um, Eric, um, you know, I've seen your movie three times now, and I got to tell you, it gets tighter and better every time. So hats off, kudos to you, majorly, majorly. My first impression was, eh, well, you know, it's cool. Don't let the facts get in the way of the truth. But in fact, you got it. You really did get it. So, uh, you know, I just, I, I love this film. I love what it says. I love what it does. I love seeing all my friends in it. And I just, I just think you did an awesome job. So thank you very, very much. Thanks, Andy. I appreciate that. Man. All right. Thank you, Andy. Um, Eric, go ahead. <clears throat> well, you know, I think one of the big takeaways is that even though there are so many issues right now facing the water in Florida, what I found are the most amazing and inspirational activists anywhere in the world. So, you know, what I see happening down there is people are actively trying to change the future. It's so important and it was incredible to get to meet everybody in the movie as well as people that I've been able to meet as, as things continue on. So, you know, we have to remember there are solutions. It's, we're not beat. Um, you know, like I think Jessica mentioned earlier, it's a David Goliath battle, but we know who won and we know how. And so, you know, we just have to make sure to take care of each other, 
keep an eye out for each other. And that's the only way we're gonna ever move forward. You know, um, I, I just wanted to say this story is particular for DeSoto, but it's also worldwide. I mean, this is a major problem. Walter brought it up. There's environmental injustice and environmental racism that was actually addressed by the president in 1994, because it is a known problem where they are just dumping toxins into neighborhoods they think cannot fight back. And this is what we need to change. This is, we have to change the way things are done. And I just wanted to bring that to light in the movie. I had no idea what I was gonna find when I got there. Um, none of it is fabricated. And if people wanna debate some of the testing, then great, let's get better testing. Let's get certified testing. Let's get, let's get some answers. So I think that's what everybody wants. Um, and so I just wanted to thank everybody for being here today and everybody that came to watch the movie. It's important that we have these conversations on a dinner table level, on a friend level, on a public level, on a state level, because again, it's the only way we're going to affect any change. So very honored to be part of, of this process. All right. I'm going to go ahead and then I'm going to let Jessica have the last word uh, because she was amazing. Thank you so much to all of the panelists. Eric, uh, the film was wonderful. Andy, I've known you for a long time. I was the first, I, the, the first time I really woke up was when I flew with you and our county commissioner uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say it the wrong way again, but I, I, I'm going to be in touch with you because I actually live in Sefner, which is one of your locations of clusters. So I need to get in touch with you anyway. Um, and I used to live in Broward. So, um, and Walter, I don't need to say anything about you. You're wonderful. Um, <laughs> But so, so thank you everybody uh, for attending, for all of your time. Um, I'm Russ Kahn. I am the state president of the Democratic Environmental Caucus of Florida. Um, you can uh, get involved with our state caucus by joining the membership link, which I will put in there um, for your dues for 22. It's 10 bucks, not a whole lot um, to join as the member. Um, and you can join a committee. You can work on a committee. We can all do all of this work and get going. Um, but I really do want to plug um, the Sarasota chapter and Jessica Arman. Um, this was her baby. She kicked me in the butt and got me moving. I've been moving a lot, but she she got me focused and directed. So with that, I'm gonna give the last words to Jessica and um, thank you everybody for your attendance. Go ahead, Jessica. Well, thank you everyone out there in Cyberland and grateful for Zooms and you know getting to see Eric is in Costa Rica and I'm here in Sarasota and Andy's in here and, and Stella is on the other beautiful coast of our wonderful state and Walter it's nice to meet all of you and uh, you know we can if we get together you know we can affect change uh, but it will take thousands of us it's not going to just be hundreds it's going to be thousands of people so we need to make everybody aware we have 24 chapters out of 67 counties of our environmental caucus and I urge you to join the one that's closest to you and get involved. We can make a difference. We need to, um, you know, stay in, in, in touch with one another and work in unity. I don't care if you're an, an NPA or, a, a, you know, a them or a Republican. I love everybody and everyone knows who's met me. Uh, I'm the same to everyone. I just don't talk about politics. Uh, if you'd like to become a member of our caucus, um, we did have a link in the chat and we also have a website. We're going to have our resolution on there that we got passed um, on the local level and then um, also uh, Russ's the state level. Uh, you can join a protest. I'm kind of beyond that at this point, but a lot of people like to do that. Um, you can sign petitions, um, also the fl5.org. And you can just, you can also attend the, um, meetings in DeSoto and also uh, tomorrow short notice, but there is Wednesday, October 6th. And thank you, Ruth, from our um, caucus up in Manatee County from four to seven in the Manatee uh, County or Bradenton, Manatee Downtown Central Library. They're gonna be having a last minute discussion about the draft permit on the injection law. So I thank everybody for being here and um, your time, this was a long time, but informative. And this is also the third time I've watched this film and every every time I get a new nugget. So uh, Eric and everybody in this movie, hats off to you and the very best and health as well. Please stay well. 
All right. And with that, everybody, thank you. If any of the panelists want to stay on and chat, the attendees are welcome. We're going to go ahead and stop streaming on Facebook, but we can leave this open for a little bit longer if people want to continue to chat and, and cut up and maybe answer some more questions. Um, we can actually bring attendees up and all of that stuff if you want. So I'm going to go ahead and take down the Facebook. and and But if you do want to go, you are free to go. Uh, thank you, everybody on Facebook world. I've got nowhere else to be. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go ahead.